good evening and welcome to the Heterodox History Podcast. Today's discussion, the scouring of England, the cultural legacy of the dissolution of the monasteries. I am very lucky to be joined by John Dee himself. Hello. Hello, Your Majesty, and I am <laughs> very pleased and honoured to, to be here. Uh, always a bit of a fright for me. I, I, I look up to you and I love your uh, uh, your um, programs, so uh, it, it's, it's always an honour. Well, thank you very much, but I'm hoping this will be less sort of chronologically dense than usual. I'm hoping that this can be more of an open conversation about the nature of medieval English culture, medieval English architecture, to less extent English medieval music, a, an aspect of social history and how all of this pertains to the great sort of social and cultural and religious revolution of the early modern era, which many sort of historians say with these sort of very tentative terms, such as medieval transitions away from medieval society into something else, which acts as some sort of forerunner to civil society or modern day managerialisms, ultimately sort of ending up in liberal democracy. But as for focusing this conversation on the dissolution of, mon of the monasteries, um, you and I were talking about this idea of this sort of the stymieing or the death of a native English culture. And it came back to this idea of architecture and Elizabethan great houses in some ways representing a debased form of an English style of architecture, but also just focusing on the dissolution of the monasteries themselves as representing a lost window into another realm within a realm. And something that really sort of made me think about this topic was a passage from, of all things, Disraeli Sybil or the Two Nations, which was written at the height of the Gothic revival during the Victorian era. And this is just an excerpt from what a character known as the Stranger says to Egremont. If the world but only knew what they had lost, I am sure that not the faintest idea is generally prevalent of the appearance of England before and since the disillusion. Why, sir, in England and Wales alone, there were of these institutions of different sizes, I mean monasteries, chantries, chapels, great hospitals, considerably upward of 3,000, all of them fair buildings, many of them of exquisite beauty. There were on an average in every shire at least 20 structures, such as this was, and in this great county, double that number, establishments that were vast and as magnificent and as beautiful as your Belvoirs, as your Chatsworths, your Wentworths and your Stowes. Try to imagine the effect of 30 or 40 Chatsworths in this country, the proprietors of which were never absent. You complain enough now of absentees, referring to absentee lords. The monks were never non-resident. They expended their revenue among those who labored, uh, whose labor had produced it. These holy men, too, built and planted as they did everything else for posterity. Their churches were cathedrals, their schools, colleges, their halls and libraries, their monument rooms of kingdoms, their woods, waters, their farms and gardens were laid out and disposed on a scale and in a spirit that are now extinct. They made the country beautiful and the people proud of their country. Um, what do you think of those sort of almost sort of fantastical thoughts um, being put into the mouth of the stranger by Disraeli? I think they're perfectly apt. I mean, you know, again, if you if you um, if you read any of the kind of uh, history, historical and arch or slash ar archaeological kind of uh, investigations of, of of what happened during that period uh, and the scale of the cultural, um, you know, loss, uh, I, I think that's 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 probably perfectly fair. I mean, obviously, a bit of an exaggeration, you know, considering. Uh, um, the smaller scale of, of, of life, uh, you know, uh, in those days. But uh, I, I think it brings home the point about, you know, basically the, you know, the, the, com the complete sort of transformation of, uh, uh, of you know, uh, yes, physical, certainly physical culture uh, uh, and, um, you know, and the, and the entire cultural history that preceded um, the, um, the dissolution. Of course, just to try and try and re-emphasize this, I mean, these are th this is a feeling that didn't just arouse suddenly, three hundred years after the fact during the eighteen thirties and the eighteen forties, but a sort of counter um, antiquarianism happened almost immediately. The uh, pilgrimage of grace, which 
is a topic I really want to get into in terms of understanding the nature of the English dissolution. It's some, it was a response that happened in the year that Parliament passed the first dissolution of the smaller monasteries. A um, hundred years later, when we get to the preamble before the English Civil War, these are the thoughts of a supporter of King Charles I, John Denham, who sees these dismal heaps, referring, of course, to the ruins of the great monasteries, but would demand what barbarous invader sacked the land. But when he hears no Goth, no Turk did bring this desolation, but a Christian king, when nothing but the name of zeal appears, twixt our best actions and the worst of theirs, what does he think our sacrilege would spare when such the effects of our devotions are? Of course, with reference to aspects, of course, of the particularness of the English Reformation. But perhaps here it would be useful to have a brief overview of exactly what the English Reformation was and what it entailed with regard to the dissolution of the monasteries. I mean, it's more complicated than the idea that Henry VIII just wanted to uh, to bed Anne Boleyn and she was playing hard to get, <laughs> which is the most sort of yeah. reductionist way the of... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, that may have been some aspect of it, but it was much more uh, complicated than that. But uh... The idea of individual sort of disillusions of the small or smaller monasteries wasn't new. It was something that was played out in England since the, the 14th century. But the scale was completely new and completely revolutionary. But of course, England wasn't the first to do it. Across the channel in the continent, you had a much more zealous iteration of the Reformation. And when it comes to understanding England's own Reformation, it's important to understand that within the sort of legal framework that Thomas Cromwell, the uh, the minister with responsibility for ecclesiastical affairs, i.e. the monasteries, wanted to present this not as a revolution or an attack on the property of the church. Rather, the Reformation was presented as an English restoration, that papal prerogatives and papal power over that of the king were some form of usurpation. And indeed, monastic lands, by extension, were technically held by the king's own grace on the king's crown land. I found it fascinating when looking at the first act, which got rid of some of the monasteries, not all, um, that it wasn't framed in terms of the supremacy or the Reformation, but in almost in terms of the idea of escheating territory, to escheat is eff effectively all land is held in trust by ultimately by the person of the crown. Say, for example, if a noble family uh, were to die out, then the land would return back to the crown. Thereby, the logic was that all of this land was simply held in trust, and now the crown has revoked that trust to some extent with regards to the monasteries. But also, I want to assess this idea of the paradox that that represents. On the one hand, you're trying to present this as some sort of glorious English Reformation, that you're taking back these powers from the papacy, um, with, even within the context of Henry VIII. Henry VIII, it wasn't as simple to look at him as some sort of iconoclastic brute. Um, he very much believed that, or convinced himself rather, that monastic standards were falling. The you can say almost the post hoc justification for the dissolution of the monasteries was the fact that monastic life in England, whether it be, you know, the, the friars, whether it be the monks, whether it be the convents, the nunneries, etc. This was supposed to represent some form of common good for the Christian population of England, and that it was a central element of, again, the, the focus on prayer, on uh, life which is spent in the pursuit of God, but also in terms of the friars and people offering practical services for the communities in which they serve, but also um, arms and support also for would-be vagrants and the poorest elements of the community as well. So ecclesiastical buildings and ecclesiastical structures, abbeys, convents, monasteries, um, to some extent were great boons to the local communities. They're also great sources of learning and information um, as part of a greater nexus of convents and um, uh, clerical orders throughout all of Europe. Say, for example, we take the Cistercian orders, we take the Benedictine orders. So invariably, some of the members of the convent, some of the nuns um, and the monks were very well educated. Some could speak French and Latin in addition to speaking English. And they also hell hoarded knowledge as well and hoarded religious artifacts. 
there's something in particular also to reference with the idea of the dissolution of the monasteries being post hoc rationalized as this idea of an English restoration. It's not just that they were Christian holy sites, these, these monasteries, and central, you could say, for the understanding of a contemplative life and being great bastions of prayer for the wider Christian community represented with the common wheel. But it's this idea that some of these monasteries in particular had direct mythical nationalist implications. Say, for example, we take Glaston Glastonbury Cathedral. On the right here is an image of part of the um, des a desecrated uh, site of Glastonbury Cathedral. Glastonbury Cathedral claimed in hindsight to have some sort of mystical connection to King Arthur. Indeed, it was even claimed that it was founded by Joseph of Arimathea. If we go look to Edmund Saint uh, uh, Barry Saint Edmunds, Barry Saint Edmunds was associated with Edmund the Martyr, one of the few English kings to actually be sainted. The other, of course, sainted English king was that of Edward the Confessor, and Henry the Third in the thirteenth century reconsecrated Westminster Abbey as some sort of national sort of iconography devoted to the cult of Edward the Confessor, and of course. It was famous for its Benedictine monastery, ultimately. So all of these buildings have ancient, ancient sort of sacred symbolism, not just for Christian meaning, but also for national meaning. And of course, you even have the, uh, the sacred site and, of pilgrimage of the, uh, the temple of St. Thomas the Becket. So can you think of anything else, Dee, in terms of sort of the, the mystical sort of attachment or association which the monasteries and the abbeys had with regards to England itself? Uh, not not m much more than that. I mean, you know, m and of course, by the time of the, you know, the, the, the solutions, uh, many of the, many of these communities were, but they, were, they weren't that old. They weren't that established. I mean, many of them were established, you know, post uh, 1300. Uh, so yeah, it would have been a smaller number that had these kind of, kind of more more ancient and more uh, tied to uh, yeah the sort of mythic uh, the mythic past of uh, Britain. Um, but uh, no, I, I I can't really think. I mean, certainly Glastonbury. I mean, there, there's a few there's a few there's a couple of other sites uh, which I can't recall the name at the moment that were that had that had similar associations, but. Um, yeah, but um, but yeah, I think I think it's it's also important that uh, you know to to realize that that there, there had been a great sort of uh, what what do you say a great sort of flourishing and and great sort of new um, expansion of of monastic communities, uh, not much more than two hundred years before the the dissolution. So. Therefore, why would Henry VIII want to dissolve the monasteries and how could it be arguably justified on the basis of seizing back these powers? Well, Henry VIII, of course, was convinced and horrified by accounts that, you know, say, for example, monks were having it on with nuns, monks were having it on with children, etc. These, the, these things have unfortunately always been uh, the source of accusations, whether exaggerated or not within these various institutions. And in many ways, this wasn't a new thing. So it's interesting that now is the time that Thomas Cromwell and Henry VIII uses this and tries to publish black propaganda as a means to justify the abolition of these institutions after the fact, because the purveyors of them were utterly corrupt. There's also the idea that the marriage in particular, the marriage of Henry VIII with Catherine of Aragon, because Catherine of Aragon had been his brother's wife, the wife of um, uh, Prince Arthur. Arthur. The idea, therefore, is that he is breaching Leviticus and that the Pope erred in granting that special dispensation which permitted the marriage between Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. And this forms qu quite a strong basis in terms of understanding his theological underpinnings as to why he believes he is right in assuming that power and the fact that the Pope misjudged and misused his authority to essentially pervert the the laws of God as illustrated in Leviticus. But also there is this, this pragmatic idea about consolidating control over the country, removing that nation within the nation and accumulating vast sums of money. 
because Henry VIII, in addition to many things, was a failure when it comes to international affairs. He wanted to be king of Scotland. He tried and failed to arrange that through um, through marriage dealings, and he tried and failed to become king of France. The most su successful sort of element of him was a, a brief victory against the French called the Battle of the Spurs, and holding on to this minor settlement called Terouanne um, in what is now Belgium. But ultimately, all of this was lost. And instead, Henry VIII has been relegated to the Pale of Calais. Virtually all of England's possessions have been lost. And so how is one supposed to gain glory? Well, one gains glory by asserting your undisputed control over the Church of England through the form of the supremacy associated with all these things. And also a Protestant faction coming in with Anne Boleyn and Thomas Cromwell, who are prompting the king, saying he ultimately has the authority. He simply needs to grab out, to, to stretch out his hand and grab it. Um, that's in terms of understanding the context of the dissolution of the monasteries, but moving on to why the dissolution of the monasteries in particular, what was the justification for it? We've already, I've already said that part of the official justification was this idea of eschating that territory, that it was always the kings to be held in trust, and that the smaller monasteries had misused that authority. There wasn't a theological sort of prohibition against monastic life, which is interesting to note. Rather, this came about, you can say, within this sort of legalistic framework of Thomas Cromwell in terms of cementing royal authority. It's also interesting to, uh, to think that had things played out a little bit differently, that there would have, wouldn't have been a total dissolution of the monasteries. Rather, the smaller monastic institutions would have been amalgamated with the larger monastic institutions mm -hmm. like Bury St. Edmunds, like Tintern, like Westminster. And therefore, ostensibly, they could be reformed by the individual abbots or abbesses. And understandably, when you have fewer institutions, you get rid of the smaller ones. They're actually yeah. easier to control. And thereby, you can sort of represent or recontextualize the relationship of the remaining monasteries to the crown but that of course didn't happen because yeah. in 1536 and 1537 there was a large grassroots movement also supported by a, a large number of catholic of crypto catholic cl clergymen and uh, catholic nobles called the pilgrimage of grace which nearly won henry the eighth had to resort to trickery and subversion to split the head of the pilgrimage of grace away from the rest of the protesters and then crush them all in turn and to my mind it is the pilgrimage of grace the reaction against the policy of the dissolution of monasteries, which makes this movement, turns this um, reformation away from ecclesiastical consolidation into the outright removal of an entire pillar of ecclesiastical life in England. Do you think that's a fair assessment? I think that's a, a, a fair assessment. And I mean, keep in mind that, of course, uh, I mean, Henry VIII was certainly, you know, he had, there was no Protestant motivation you know, he, he was not, I, I think, particularly, uh, you know, interested in any of these this sort of uh, theological justification for it, necessarily. Uh, and, and, of course, you know, I mean, people should remember that he is the person, I mean, he is the monarch who who brought the title of Fide Defensor, you know, you know to, the, to the monarchy. Uh, you know, he, he, early in his reign, uh, in fact, had some very colourful correspondence with Martin Luther uh, himself, uh, uh, with Henry VIII um, assuming the the role of you know defending the supremacy of the, of the Pope. So you know early on he he certainly had uh, at least um, you know at least um, uh, the appearance of uh, you know supporter of uh, you know a supporter of the the you know, the, um, the centrality of the, of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and and Crom, you know, and 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 Cromwell, um, uh, as as you say, also wished to bring this sort of diffuse, diffuse community. I mean, all of these smaller monastic communities to bring them under more control of of, of a bishopric. You know, um, a, a sort of centralizing motivation. Uh, um, yeah, I think that's all. Uh, perfectly perfectly fair uh, there were also uh, it's interesting you note the title of felix defense or defender of the faith which was bestowed 
on Henry the Eighth by a Pope. Um, was it Leo the Tenth um, or Clement the Seventh? Um, oh. Anyway, anyway, um, the title was bestowed as a result of the admonition against Luther, which Henry the Eighth penned with the assistance of Saint Thomas More. Yeah, it also should be noted that this is uh, the time of the uh, uh, the Humanist revival. Um, not only was St. Thomas More influencing Henry VIII, but of course Erasmus yeah. was influencing Henry VIII. And Erasmus had very little to say in terms of support of the monastic institutions. But in terms of understanding Henry VIII's mindset, I very much see it as him wanting to clean up the monasteries rather than him wanting to dissolve the monasteries. However, in response to this direct attack on his authority through the Pilgrimage of Grace, it solidifies two things. First of all, that he needs to rule by force. He needs to assert this policy in, as a response to treason, this act of defiance. But it demonstrates to him also that if he is going to separate from Rome, he needs to remove those institutions which would prioritize their loyalty to God and, by extension, the Pope over that of the king. And so, say, for example, the Benedictines and the Cistercians, any orders which have any links across seas, there is a nationalistic impetus when it comes to asserting sovereignty to removing these various institution, institutions. And there's also, of course, the monetary motive. So what begins is this process to escape. And of course, there are other motivations as well, such as removing the power of the clergy as represented in parliament with regards to the House of Lords. And what begins is this small scale attack on, you say, the outlying monasteries as a result of this drive to clean up the monasteries. Instead, it turns into a massive land grab, um, a secular land grab, it should be noted. Because this pillar of life in England has been destroyed, who is entering into the void? It is these men from London, these up and coming sort of yeoman and uh, petty bourgeoisie, or I prefer the sort of German term, the Bürgerliche, like Thomas Cromwell himself, young professionals, urban professionals, but also yeah. gentry are coming in. They're coming in and they're buying out the land. And uh, essentially it's wonderful to think in terms of this idea of English architecture and the elements of the monasteries actually being repurposed and refashioned into these into these English country houses as well, um, in terms of this repurposing. Um, so in the one sense, it satisfies all the other parties. It reconsolidates their loyalty to the king because he has facilitated this massive land grab. And at once he's also destroying something which could be seen as subversive. And yeah. there is a very loose post hoc theological justification associated with it. Oh, well, all these abbots were corrupt anyway. There's also a huge amount of, you could say, cynicism and self-interested associated with the nuns and the bishop and the bishops who went along with the dissolution of the monasteries. Because you have, of course, the commissioners sent out by Thomas Cromwell, the man in charge of ecclesiastical affairs. Um, there has been this great assessment of all the monastic wealth, all the monastic lands. And it's not simply a matter that they knock on the door and the monks capitulate and the land is seized and then sold off. There is an individual response to every different monastic organization. In some cases, the inhabitants are simply bribed and bribed essentially they're allowed to keep their jobs. They're simply going to be reassigned within the ecclesiastical jurisdiction of England. In other instances, such as at Glastonbury, the abbot, the abbot there, the last abbot who was uh, Richard Whiting, uh, refused. He basically allowed Glastonbury, Glastonbury Abbey to come under siege, and he was evicted militarily by force, declared a traitor, was hanged, drawn and quartered in Glastonbury Tor. So the responses for the individual monasteries, you know, varied from, from, from monastery to monastery. But of course, the Whiting example is the most extreme version of this. But it wasn't England's finest moment in any respect in terms of the, the willing abandoning of this whole pillar of ecclesiastical life and by extension, surrendering your links to Rome as, as part of the Reformation, but also in terms of the enforcers of Thomas Cromwell having to be sent after and to basically lay, see, lay siege to these ecclesiastical organizations and then post hoc say, well, they're corrupt, you know, they're, um, they're dittering little boys, etc. Um, 
it all just reeks of cynicism and materialism and degeneracy of every sort of sort. Mm. Yeah, this is a very important point because there's this, I think, a, probably a widespread idea that, you know, this this all happened. I mean, this all was able to happen because there was some widespread sentiment uh, amongst people that, you know, that church was corrupt or these organizations were corrupt and, you know, that, that uh, the church had gone astray and, and uh, you know, and, and these, uh, you know, these organizations which had been established by uh, and establish and endowed to, uh, you know, to um, enrich the Christian community and educate laity and, and, and all of those things. But that's not really true in Britain. I mean, that may have been continental motivation uh, for similar activities that went on uh, with the with the, the period of the Reformation. But, uh, you know, in, in, in England and in, in, in Britain, it just wasn't the case. People were mostly not on board with these ideological motivations and so when it did you know happen uh, as am said it, it happened as just an opportunity for you know low people of all sorts and, and in all stations to take advantage of this you know this free-for-all <laughs> uh, basically so I, I think it's um you know it's it, it it's difficult to kind of attach any sort of you know sincere, uh, religious motivations to to how it turned out. I mean, there may have been some reform-minded, uh, even with Cromwell, some 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 mind to reform at the beginning of it. But you know, certainly by the end of it, it was just uh, you know, it was just materialism, uh, as far as I'm concerned. A cacophony of self-interest. And on the one hand, you say that some of these monastic institutions haven't been here very long, which is very true in terms of the sheer diversity of all of yeah. the various institutions. But just take Glastonbury as an example. Even though Glastonbury claimed to be founded much earlier, we can associate its founding with the 8th century. So this is an, this is an organization which has been around for nearly a thousand years. It mm. pre it pre um it pre um it existed before the Norman conquest. It existed even before Alfred the Great. And here it's been demolished in terms of this appropriation of power or this restoration of power by the English king. It should also be noted that uh, uh, Whiting in some respects would have the last laugh because Thomas Cromwell would be um, <laughs> executed the year later in, like, <laughs> in, in 1540. Yeah, it didn't work out so well for Cromwell. Uh... Uh, if it's possible, I have this um, excerpt. It's only four pages long. I've linked this article in the description. It's by, um, oh, sorry, I'm missing the, it's the English Ruins and English History, The Disillusion of the Sense of Past by Margaret Aston, uh, just to give some accounts of the nature of the disillusion. Um, okay, I, I just wanted to, I'm just looking for something I wanted to make a point of earlier, and I find it, uh, just to give a sense of, <laughs> of the scale of this, uh, um, in uh in in fifteenth in the late by the late fifteen thirties there were nine nearly nine hundred religious houses in England around two hundred sixty for monks three hundred for regular canons one hundred forty two nunneries one hundred eighty three friaries some twelve thousand people in total four thousand monks three thousand canons three thousand friars and three thousand nuns um if the adult male population was five hundred thousand that meant one Adult man in fifty was in religious orders, so I just wanted to give people the. I mean, also looking at that that map on the, the left left hand side, to give people an idea of the scale of, of these institutions. Uh, so. No, thank you, and uh, that's that's wonderful to to set up the the excerpt I have in terms of the the sheer scale, but also that percentage. You know that two percent of the population at this point was in holy orders. Again, it's it's almost absurd to think in terms of a modern or indeed a postmodern mindset, how essential the functions of religious life and prayer were. But of course, this is the death of an entire iteration of England. Indeed, and, and, and in my opinion, maybe not the most popular opinion, but uh, I mean, the, the traditional uh, uh, arrangement, and the, the, the traditional, the sort of uh, traditional kind of um, religious 
like uh, faith of, 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 of you know there, there's this idea that Catholicism is a sort of alien to uh, to, to Britain which of yeah. course uh, all all of this information should be paid to that uh, well it's almost incidental with England isn't it you know the supremacy wasn't overtly anti-papist it was simply caesaropapist the idea that the king should have ecclesiastical jurisdiction over the pope not that we all become anti-popes and then we all burn an effigy of him every 5th of november yeah exactly as with the monasteries it doesn't begin as an anti-monastic order but it becomes monkery is almost held in the same breath as popery so Again, there is this underlying sort of cynicism and uh, happenstance with the English Reformation that doesn't really exist across the across the channel. So this is from the article by Aston. In order to appreciate the intensity of these Aquarian and antiquarian passions, and she's referencing the veneration of the ruins, such as the one on the right, it is necessary to recall the drastic workings of Henry VIII's commissioners. I defaced the church windows and the cellars of the daughter, as I did in every place, saving in Bedford and Aylesbury, where were few, um, again, it's in Old English, so I may m mispronounce words, I'm very sorry, um, where a few briars, John London conscientiously reported back to Thomas Cromwell in 1538 about the friars he had been dissolving, friaries he had been dissolving. I pulled down no house thoroughly at noon of... <clears throat> noon of the friars but so to face them as they should not lightly be made friaries again the royal agents received specific instructions for demolition and the work of destruction intentionally designed it uh, designed to make it impossible for monastic quote-unquote nests ever to be settled in again concentrated upon those parts of the building which were specially devoted to the communal conventional life it may please your good lordship to understand, John Freeman, another of Cromwell's deputies, wrote to his master in August of 1539, that the king's commission commandeth me to pull down to the ground all the walls of the churches, steeples, cloisters, freighters, daughters, chapel, uh, chapter houses, with all other houses, saving them that be necessary for a farmer. It was not that the labour of a day, given the solidity of thick-walled medieval buildings and the fulfilment of Freeman's commission, was made more difficult by the fact that it was harvest time, and, as he said, a hundred men be scant seen in a week in, a sum, in some houses. But the commissioners, as usual, tailoring rural commands to fit local circumstances, duly went about their work, and during those years of the later 1530s, many monastic buildings were wrecked or dismantled. Many of those who witnessed it must have found it a mournfully memorable sight, for the ending of monastic life in England was accomplished in quite a spectacular way, such as that of revolutionary France, and the physical impact of the scene of directed destruction which accompanied it was certainly equally dramatic. Some of the surviving English records convey, almost as graphically as later French descriptions, of the ending of the great abbeys like Raymond or Cluny, the scale of what was involved. Um, I'm re reading this in excerpts, D, so if you want to uh, butt in at any point, please do so. Okay. In the spring and early summer of 1538, work was in progress at Chertsey Abbey for nearly three months. Besides masons, carpenters, bricklayers and plumbers, sometimes as many as 90 labourers were needed. One wonders how far their wages were covered by the sails the materials were covered, which included the stones and pinnacles of the steeple, carefully dismantled and preserved with the, uh, with the aid of baskets and straw. A full account of these dramatic and melancholy proceedings survives for Lewis Priory. This house was granted to the son of the King's Vicar General, Gregory Cromwell, who moved into the Priory's house and reported to paternal headquarters that his wife found it, so commodious that she think herself to be here right well settled um again another aspect <laughs> the fact that they um do you remember this is a really sort of a silly comparison do you remember the uh, the carry on film about the french <laughs> revolution um carry on chopping or carry on don't lose your head or something like that yeah i can't remember what it's called yeah 
And, and there's a moment in it where uh, Kenneth Williams is, uh, he's moving into this wonderfully cool, it's actually the uh, Rothschild mansion, uh, but they use it as some form of uh, Ertzatz French chateau and they call it Chateau Neuf wonderfully. Um, and they go in it and uh, Kenneth Williams's character is going on about saying how this is my new resident. It was rewarded for me for uh, my services to the revolution. Ooh, bye. Me, of course. <laughs> it just sort of reeks of this. Uh, these these <laughs> despicable up and coming, you know, men just coming in and taking all these properties, stealing it under this sort of, uh, <laughs> again, righteous guise. And it just seems as absurd and trivial as that moment in the Carry On film. Exactly. It, it, yeah, and it is carry on, don't lose your head from 1967. To... <laughs> yeah. The Church of Lewis Priory was of massive proportions, requiring careful planning of the demolition by Giovanni uh, Putinari, who sent Cromwell uh, bulletins on its progress, giving the exact measurements of the building with its 32 pillars, eight of which were 14 feet thick and 45 in circumference and the other 10 uh, feet thick and 25 in circumference. The works began to the right of the high altar with the destruction of its vaults and surrounding chapels. For this purpose, the foundations were undermined, props put in and then fired, with the results which were successful in the third week of March 1538. In the case of Stanley Abbey in Wiltshire, which was so thoroughly despoiled by its new owner that there was hardly anything left to see by the time that Jane Aubrey wrote about it around 1665. Excavations carried out early uh, the century had revealed that here too, part of the church had been pulled down in a similar fashion by mining um, op uh, operations and props, apparently killing one of the workmen in the process. It was not labor for the unskilled and Portinari took down to Lewis from London 17 men, including carpenters, smiths, plumbers, and a furnace man who were deemed more experienced than local labor and possibly also less likely to be inhibited by any local sympathies for any old familiar building. So again, you know, it's kind of like the scouring of the Shire, which was the reference obviously for the stream, uh, bringing in these, these various ruffians to inhabit and uh, construct all of these awful monstrosities across the Shire. But in the case of this, it's removing an entire pillar of uh, English life. Indeed, and that's a, you know, that's an age old tragedy and one that's still used today. You know, it, it's, it's easy to bring in a foreign force because they won't have, as you say, they won't have these sympathies for you know, the architecture of the people or, or, or anything like that. So, uh, you yeah. know, oh, it's, it's very painful to, <laughs> to hear all of this because, again, it's, 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 it's impossible for people to imagine uh, the scale and, and just, just, you know, exactly what was lost uh, through this period. And I mean, not just, you know, it, it wasn't just, you know, the, the sort of material things. They were also, uh, they were also uh, defiling graves, you know, tossing, uh, re remains and in some cases the remains of martyrs you know in in in, in the field and uh and such so uh, i mean it was, it was it was quite horrible enterprise even those and they included all sorts who hoped to profit from the distribution of monastic goods might well have had qualms about assisting in the thunderous ruin of a church in or near which they and perhaps their forebears had been accustomed to worship yet the scrabble for spoils accounted for a great deal. It was not only the well-placed whose interest in monastic lands has received so much attention who profited. The ecclesiastical dismemberment put a whole mass of different materials on the market, timber, glass, furniture, lead, household goods of all descriptions, and local buyers and filchers of every kind clearly had their eyes and ears open. Richard Layton may well have been exaggerating a little to emphasize his own forethought when he described how a fire broke out on his visitation of Christchurch, Canterbury, and he had set a watch on bandogs to keep care of the rich shrine of St. Thomas on the grounds. If I had not taken that order for a spoil within the church, that there would um, have harm done, there would have been harm done. And as it was, he wrote, poor people took advantage of the circumstances to make off with the bedding which had been thrown into the cloister. There must have been a large amount of unrecorded pilfering and fiddling, and it may be assumed that a goodly proportion of monastic property found its way into the households of those who, without necessarily being motivated in any particular direction towards the religious, were watchful for such opportunities. 
the poor, the, the uh, sorry, the poor people, thoroughly in every place, be so greedy upon these houses of friars when they be suppressed, that by night and day, not only of the towns but also of the country, do they continually resort as long as any do um, to to wood? Sorry, again, I some of these words I can't actually say. To glass, to loose, to leadle, to remain if any of them in terms of just gutting these houses, removing them of all sort of implements, ornaments, furniture, etc. What John London experienced in Warwick was not peculiar to that place. It was a universal greediness, most human and comprehensible. And so 30 years after he brought up part of the timbers of the dissolved Cistercian Abbey of Roche in Yorkshire, a father found himself being examined by his clerical son. How was it, questioned this filial conscience, that you, thinking well of the religious, could have participated in their spoliation? What should I do, said he, might I not as well as others have some profit of the spoil of the abbey? For I did see all wood away, and therefore I did as others did. He got who he could, what he could. And that's a very tired and uh, depressing old adage. Yeah. The fate of Roche was typical of many houses. The church, as we learn from the story of the saddened son, was the first of the buildings to suffer. Then followed the abbot's lodging the daughter, the freighter, the cloister, and neighbouring buildings inside the abbey walls. The writer's uncle, being then a young unmarried man and not having any immediate use for house, household utensils, refused the offer to buy a monk's cell door for um, uh, two pence. Others, however, were less restrained. Such persons as afterwards brought um, their corn or hay or such found all the doors either open or the locks and shackles plucked away or the doors itself taken away, went in and took what they found filtered away. Local um, uh, cormorants lent helping hands to the work of the central agents. Nothing was spared but the ox houses, the swine coats and such other houses of the officer that stood without, uh, without the walls which had more favour showed them than the very church itself. Even at Roche followed the usual pattern. What we know of the labourers at Lewis and elsewhere makes it unlikely that in general, as Fuller put it, the church building was cripple in going up, but rides post in coming down. There might indeed be cases, especially perhaps after rain and frost and pillagers had followed up the first decisive steps, where a day's determined effort could do a great deal. The remains of Repton Priory in Derbyshire, which was Fuller's example, were apparently pulled down one Sunday in Mary's reign by Gilbert Thacker, son of Thomas Cromwell's zealous steward, Thomas Thacker, who was fearful of the Queen's plans of monastic restoration and said he would destroy the nest for fear the birds would build therein again. In general, though, the very expense of the demolition procedures imposed some limits upon the hopes of raising all uh, uh, covenantal buildings to the ground and there were reportedly still enthusiasts who had ideas about carrying on the work in the dames, days of James I. Henry VIII's servants realised the limits to the envisageable destruction as John Freeman told Cromwell about the substantial houses of Lincolnshire I certify your lordship that you will be charged bull to the, to the king the doing pulling of them if should follow the commission by less majesty, 1,000 pounds within the share. Again, I, I do apologize for my, it, it, the article is very sort of condensed. It's tiny writing, all sort of uh, compressed. If, if you want to understand what I'm saying, do read the article, it's linked in the description. What he recommended therefore was the removal of the bells and lead, the sale of which would realize a large sum. And this was done to pull down the rows, the battlements, the stairs, and let the walls stand the charge sum with a quarter of a stone to make sales of which they need to fetch. The number of extant monastic ruins owes something to the obvious soundness of this argument, as well as to the staunchness of medieval buildings. And that is probably a link to what I want to really have your input in, D, which is on the architecture itself of these buildings and the devastation for English Gothic and the English style. Um, I have a brief sort of introduction by Thomas Rickman, who was an architect from the early 
19th century, late 18th century, early 19th century, uh, who was noteworthy in terms of building up all these early Gothic revival Waterloo churches as commemoration of uh, obviously Wellington's victory over Napoleon in 1815. Um, but before I, I read this, and I would really get, like to get your input on this, um, any thoughts as to the procedures involved in the dissolution itself? Well, I mean, so evinced by the number of ruins that you know still exist all over, all over, certainly England and, and Britain uh, to a larger extent. Um, you know, these buildings were uh, extraordinarily extraordinary feats of, I would, I would say, design and construction. You know, you you had reference to the thickness of pillars and and walls, and and indeed. Uh, some of the, the stone architecture of these. I mean, as you can see there with Glastonbury Abbey, um, and you know, it basically, if you visited any ruin, you know, I mean, they were very difficult to take down um, because they were built in in in, in such a manner. But uh, you know, and it, it, it these certainly the the early one, the earlier ones, and, and, and so even even the newer ones, the, even the new, newer established uh, houses. They came from an age where this sort of this sort of age where the 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 effort was largely anonymous and collective and geared towards the glorification of God and the service of the you know the whatever monastic or community or friary was. Um, and, it, and so it wasn't really you know the I mean the, the idea of an architect. Uh, you know, of, of these being architecture and and there being an architect. I mean, the architect was in 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 a, in a sense the architect was was God, and these buildings were meant as a kind of glorification of this idea. So mm. they, they 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 had. I mean, obviously they had people, you know, uh, specific people sort of working on the design, and they had stonemasons and people, you know, who understood how to, uh, you know, how they needed to be constructed so they wouldn't fall down. But but again, you know, all of this is sort of gloriously anonymous in a way, and these these buildings sort of you know they they accrued rather like a coral reef or like a uh, you know you know um, uh, a sort of aggregation uh, you know because they took a long time to build. In some cases, they took you know fifty, a hundred years to build some of them, and of course they were ongoing pro projects. And so again. It, it's not just like okay, if someone put up a building and now we're going to pull it down. I mean, this this was the work of of hundreds and thousands of hands over over many years. Um, you know, defying this idea of kind of singular design. You know, and and as I said, sort of growing by accretion. So it, it was it was even worse than the idea of just pulling down a building. It was it was pulling down. Uh, I, I I think a kind of a kind of wash, a wash of God in stone, uh, uh, and and other materials, and of course, you know, as as your excerpt mentions, you know, we think of these buildings as being just big stone things, but of course, they all also had, you know, interiors and fitments and all of this. I mean, the stone remains because, of course, that's the most sturdy thing. But everything else was was for many of these buildings was pulled out. Every sort of bit of ornamentation, every bit of furniture. The floors, the you know, any sort of uh, separatory wooden you know structures inside. I mean, the, the you know, uh, any any kind of hangings, everything was removed, um, and and of course nothing more valuable than all the gold that was used in these buildings, which of course was the primary interest of, of Henry VIII, because a lot of the revenue. If you want to call it revenue, or a lot of the the blood money that came from from this activity uh, financed his, you know, his disastrous adventures in the 1540s. Uh, so, um, you know, it's it it is very difficult to kind of meditate on this without just just feeling this profound sense of loss. I mean, and uh, but again, you see that so many people were willing to just step up. And in the face of all their ancestors had had kind of built up for their community and for their faith to just step up and pull it down with no thought whatsoever. And I think it says something terrible about, you know, unchecked human nature uh, 
to, to, to amuse on that to amuse on that fact but um uh so and, and you know of course we we also have a different feeling about these ruins i mean we we've we've come through the romantics to kind of think of ruins as an aesthetic you know that they, they, they haven't and they and, and indeed they do have an aesthetic they do have a a certain feeling as ruins but i mean they should also be be viewed as you know corpses wounds you know because they're you know the, these picturesque things are, are, the, are the skeletons of a of a once great uh of a once great civilization um so anyway no that was extremely well put and i want to um to build on some points there before I actually go on to this, uh, this tangent about architecture. I mean, for me to sound, you know, incredibly sort of pretentious, it would be England being debased from the transcendent to the temporal, from the heavenly to the worldly, um, as in terms of the implications, in terms of the transformation of architecture itself, from this idea of eternity associated with the buildings. And as such, they're almost impossible to pull down without without excessive um, expense, which would defeat the whole point of what is basically a plunder exercise um, versus, again, you can say the more makeshift buildings which we come to associate now. Um, in that sense, it's fascinating. But I also want to talk on this because I, I might forget to mention this, but it's crucial. It's not just the gold which is being taken. It is the destruction of holy relics in particular. Yeah. And again, there's this post hoc justification for that as well, which is, oh, well, you know, essentially these would uh, facilitate uh, uh, superstition and fetishization of images, which will lead to, you know, the breaking of the commandment, you know, thou shalt not worship uh, uh, graven images, etc. But this isn't, you know, Emperor Leo the Asaurian of Byzantium, who upon defeating the armies of the Muslims, makes a conscious decision to purify his nation by destroying the images, almost an imitation of Muslims. This is again, very much a post hoc justification mm. based on this completely deplorable um, materialism, looking back on it, and the idea that everyone else is doing it, I might as well get in on the action. And what did this all result in? What was the end result of this? Well. We see the destruction of a pillar of English English life, and it's wasted on a series of pointless wars against France. It is wasted on Henry VIII constructing a new fleet. An example of this, of course, is the Mary Rose, which mm. sinks rather dramatically <laughs> on its, one of its first outings when confronted yeah. with a squadron of French ships. And English coastal fortifications which almost immediately found to be obsolete. <laughs> Again, just in terms of the, the redistribution of that wealth. And also, I think the most depressing thing for Henry VIII, it didn't even strengthen the crown in the, in the, the medium to long term. When, because it's mentioned here, and this is an important point, when Mary becomes Queen of England in 1553, after the premature death of her um, brother, Edward the uh, Edward VI, she attempts a complete restoration to Catholicism. She revokes most of the laws, um, Reformation laws made after 1529. Uh, she, along with uh, Bishop Gardner, uh, allows for a purge of the ecclesiastical institutions. She brings back clerical, clerical celibacy. However, there is one thing, and of course, the supremacy of the Pope, but there is one thing she cannot undo, which is the dissolution of the monasteries. Yeah. And more than that, as a consequence of Henry VIII, Henry VIII had destroyed the monasteries in part to facilitate royal power. Now, the plunderers, the bandits who had made away with uh, all the goods associated with the monasteries, are now so powerful that the monarch is virtually powerless to confront them the monster that Henry VIII created. And so when we see the attempted restoration of Queen Mary, it is in a very sort of piecemeal way. So for example, there was a Benedictine monastery reestablished at Westminster Abbey, um, and some crown lands are restored back to monastic lands. But when Elizabeth comes in a few years later, all of these are abolished again. Westminster Abbey in particular was briefly a cathedral under Henry VIII and um, uh, Edward VI. 
and then it finally becomes under Elizabeth I a so-called royal peculiar and effectively it almost assumes weirdly for a religious a religious um a, a religious monument basically a secular role as some sort of uh national sort of a church of the nation rather than almost a church being dedicated to god and you can see this with the various people who are interned there and how i do sort of see westminster abbey as this uh central sort of aspect of the iconography of england rather than the celebration of god and i believe that begins with elizabeth and elizabeth trying to bring back some aspect of the reformation as she believed it was construed by Henry VIII, but Henry VIII, of course, was so convoluted in his thinking, and the church which he left behind appeared so Catholic compared to what um, Thomas Cranmer and his son would try to pull off, that instead it's really under the Elizabethan settlement that we see the beginning of the true Church of England. This is um, an <clears throat> excerpt I have, and I, I have to read out the title because it always makes me laugh by uh, Thomas Rickman as a response, um, basically trying to discriminate the styles um, per the Gothic revival. And I would just laugh the idea that this any, any publisher would allow this uh, title today. An attempt to discriminate the styles of architecture in England from the conquest of the Reformation with notices of above 3,000 British edifices preceded by a sketch of the Grecian and Roman orders. <laughs> oh, very, very good title. Okay. Very precise. You know what you're getting with that title. R reminds me of, of my of my favorite seventeenth century books, whose entire entire title page is taken up by the title. <laughs> so. So I have here a, a couple of, I, I basically rearranged some excerpts from this book in order to try and make it as concise as possible, just to introduce the idea of what this does to English architecture, as Dees pointed out, taking the sacred nature of the, the ecclesiastical nature of English architecture and turning it into something else after the desecration of these monuments. On the use of the term English style, as applies to the mode of buildings, usually called Gothic, and by some, the pointed architecture. Although perhaps it might not be so difficult as it had been to, as it has supposed to be, to show that the English architects were, in many instances, prior to their continental neighbours, in those advances of style, the architecture of the continent is of very different character from the pure simplicity and boldness of composition which marks English buildings. Of the British architecture before the arrival of the Romans in the island, we have no clear account but it is not likely it differed much from the ordinary modes of uncivilized nations, the hut of wood with a variety of coverings, and sometimes the cavities of the rock were doubtless the domestic habitations of the Aboriginal Britons, and their stupendous public edifices, such as Stonehenge and others still remain to us. Of course, this was written at the beginning of the 19th century, but um, subsequent archaeology hasn't, again, really discovered much more than what has been let on here. Mm. The arrival of the Romans was a new era, they introduced, at least to some degree, their own architecture, of, of which a variety of specimens have been found. Some few still remain, of which perhaps the Gate of Lincoln is the only one retaining its original use. Although some fine specimens of workmanship have been dug up in parts, yet by far the greatest part of the Roman work in England was rude, and by no means comparable with the antiquities of Greece and Italy, though some of them executed by the Romans. When the Romans left the island, it was most likely that the attempts of the Britons were still more rude in endeavouring to imitate, but not executing on principle, the Roman work, their architecture being debased into the Saxon early Norman, intermixed with ornaments perhaps brought over by the Danes, and of course the Vikings came over just at the end of the 8th century. After the conquest, the rich, of course, 1066, the rich Norman barons erecting very magnificent castles and churches, the execution manifestly improved, though still with much similarity to the Roman mode, very much debased. Though many writers speak of Saxon buildings, those which they describe um, as such are either known to be Norman, Norman in style or are so like them that there is no real distinction. A careful examination of a great number of Norman buildings will also lead to the conclusion that the style was constantly assuming a lighter character and that the gradation is so gentle into the early English that it is difficult in some buildings to class them. So much they have in both styles. The same may be said of every advance, and this seems to be a convincing proof that the styles were the product of the gradual operations of a general improvement guided 
by the hand of genius and not a foreign importation. Of the distinctions of the English style, the discriminations of Thomas Rickman, first there is the Norman style, which prevailed to the end of the reign of Henry II, and there are some illustrations here associated with the descriptions I'm about to read, uh, 1189. So, of course, we're speaking probably from the time of William Rufus, Henry I, the beginning of the 12th century to the end of the 12th century. Distinguished by its arches being generally semicircular, they're sometimes pointed with bold and rude ornaments. I think it's also important to notice in terms of his own extrapolation about Norman style, he doesn't go into it, but also understand that Henry II's England, and even by extension, uh, the England of Henry I, was still very much indebted to the continent. Henry II really had England as basically a province of his greater empire, the basis of which was in France, not in England, based in Anjou, uh, which was his own sort of dynastic province. That's where the Plantagenets came from. So after Henry II, of course, and Richard the Lionheart, we have King John. And King John facilitates, you can say, the destruction of this great dynastic empire stretched across France. And we are very much left with little more than just England. And therefore, we talk about the early English style, which re reaches into the end of Edward I, so a 14th century style. And this is distinguished by pointed arches, long, narrow windows without mullions and a peculiar ornament. And this is uh, Thomas Rickman's description, which from its resemblance to the tooth of a shark shall be called a toothed ornament. There is decorated English reaching into the end of the reign of Edward III, so mainly the 14th century. And of course, this changes during the reign of Richard II. This style is distinguished by its large windows, which are pointed arches divided into mullions, and the tracery and flowing lines forming circles, arches, and other figures, not running perpendicularly. Its ornaments numerous and very delicately carved. Then there is perpendicular English, the last style, which is increasingly debased and appears to have been used as far as 1640, though no later additions in terms of whole buildings were created since the reign of Henry VIII. The name clearly designates this style, for the millions of the windows and the ornamental panellings run in perpendicular lines and form a complete distinction from the last of the decorated style, and many buildings of this are so crowded with ornament as to destroy and any intrinsic beauty of the design in total. The carvings are generally very delicately executed. The Reformation occasioning the destruction of many of the buildings most celebrated and mutilating others or abstracting the funds necessary for the repair seems to have put an end to the working of the English styles on principle, the square panelled and mullion windows with the wooden panelled roofs and halls of the great houses of the time of Queen Elizabeth seem rather a debased English thing um, than anything else, but during the reign of her successor, Italian architecture began to be introduced, first only in the columns of doors and other small parts, her successor of course being James I, and afterwards in larger portions, though still in a general style of this debased English. Of this introduction, the most memorable is the celebrated tower of the schools at Oxford, or rather the, the, the colleges of Oxford, where into a building adorned with pinnacles and having mullioned windows, the architect has crowded all of the five orders from the previous English styles upon each other. Some of the works of Inigo Jones are a little removed from this barbarism. And when he's talking about barbarism, I think he's using it in the literal sense in that barbarism is a reference to something foreign, but it's also representing yeah. in terms of a literal barbarism in terms of the perversion of these intrinsic styles or an authentic English style. Do you think that's fair? Yes, I, I think that's fair. I mean, I, I uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm a little more sympathetic to these sort of hybrids than than he. But oh, course, I am. Sure. I am. It's interesting to notice. Um, I, I actually like aspects of uh, quite like a lot of aspects of the 11th century architect. Uh, sorry, 17th century architecture. Um, exactly. I mean, also, if people want a reference, I mean, if you want to look at a kind of high Gothic build. Uh, like uh, uh, Wells Cathedral in um, uh, Somerset uh, is a good example of a kind of high Gothic building. I think it was uh, built built in the twelfth century, you know, throughout the twelfth century. Uh, and if you want an example of this kind of late, like perpendicular Gothic, um, the Henry the Seventh Chapel at Westminster yes. uh, would, would would be from that period. So. Longleat in Wiltshire is a rather more advanced and the banqueting house of Whitehall seems to mark a complete introduction of 
of Roman workmanship. At the close of the 17th century produced Sir Christopher Wren, a man whose powers, confessedly great, lead us to regret that he had not studied the architecture of his English ancestors with the success that he did of Rome. For while, <laughs> That's yeah. amazing, that, that sentence. I love it. <laughs> For while he raided the most magnificent, uh, for while he uh, created the most magnificent modern buildings we possess, he seems to have been pleased to disfigure the English edifices. He had to complete uh, the English edifice to complete his work. His work at um, Saint Mary of Aldermary and Saint Dunstan in the East prove how well he could execute an imitated English building when he chose to, even though. In the, even though he has departed in this respect in several aspects from the true English principles. By the end of the 17th century, the Roman architecture appears to have been well established and the works of Vitruvius and Palladio successfully studied. So here is essentially his demarcating of the, the end of the style. And of course, we wait until the decorated sort of Gothic revival of the, of the 19th century, but that's sort of moving on a bit. So in, in terms of like a broad outline, of discriminating English style. I mean, do you agree with him that there was such a thing as an English style, a uniquely English style, which wasn't just a, uh, a French or a continental importation on the eve of the English Reformation? Absolutely. I mean, so I mean, what that means is 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 more difficult um, because, of course, I think there's always going to be some hybridization going on and I, I think that's one of the hallmarks of uh, you know paradoxically of, of a kind of English style was this sort of uh, ability to kind of um, make a peace or make a settlement between various you know the, the various kind of uh, you know input because of course we had uh, as 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 he mentioned we had Romans you know we had we had the you know the Normans we had you know uh, the uh, various influences of the, you know, the Saxons and such coming in. So, you know, but I do think that, that this all amounted to a, a, a recognizable English style. You're never going to mistake, uh, you know, a French or Italian cathedral of these periods with, uh, you know, with some of the, you know, the great English, um, the great English bits of architecture. So, yes, and, and, and I also agree that the innovations of the, you know the period around and after the dissolution, with the introduction of um, the pernicious <laughs> Palladio and and others, that that was a big you know that was the sort of turning point. And I think the turning point away from what had developed as a kind of recognizable uh, in, in English style uh, of building, and 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 moved us towards, I would say less a kind of successful hybridization and more of a kind of pastiche of continental practices. So, um, yeah. But I well, think that demarcation is, his demarcations are more or less the ones I, I, would, I would agree with. And the, the central element is, of course, the dissolution of the monasteries. Yeah. And in, in, it's not just in terms of a borrowing of previous ideas, but in some cases it's a physical borrowing of the actual structures which are being <laughs> yeah. repurposed. Yeah, they, I mean, literally. And, and there are many buildings, uh, you know, in, in England and, and in Britain today, which within their fabric contain uh, the seed of, you know, an old... Uh, monastical building that was, you know, that was that was torn apart and then, you know, encrusted upon in subsequent generations. Uh, so, so yes, many buildings sort of have, un, un, unrecognizably so, uh, but but uh, you know, an, uh, a, a wrecked, uh, a wrecked religious building in in the in you know inside of them, uh, and and they they sort of accrued all of these later later additions. So. Uh, yes, and and of course, I think it also it shows the the shift in the purpose of of these great buildings. You know, I mean, we went from uh, as we as we said the, the the sort of architecture celebrating God and man's relationship with God to architecture for the comfort and and, and ennobling of a class of you know merchants and yeomen. You know, I mean, suddenly great buildings became about uh, the glorification of you know, uh, some someone's financial position rather than anything else. You know, so that this this very quick turn within several decades 
from the sacred to the miserable secular, <laughs> uh, I think is is a, is is really the notable shift and the linchpin of you know coming disasters. And and of course, it's not just an architecture. Oh, architecture leads on nicely from the physical dissolution of the buildings, but of course, there was there were fundamental changes in the nature of English music as well. Oh. As a because again, when we have to think of music in the Middle in the Middle Ages, you know, ap apart from you know the style of the troubadours, etc., and, and many other sort of more local folklorist traditions, the emphasis on church music, in particular the Gregorian chant, again associated with monastic reform, because music again is essential, especially from a Catholic understanding, in terms of bringing you into this meditative meditative form of worship. Even just saying the prayers, you know, is, is not enough just to say, uh, you know, the Hail Mary, you know, a hundred times. You need to be imbuing the words and music and allowing you to construct prayers and hymns in this way is essential in terms of bringing in a life to the words, allowing you to contemplate. Um, but of course, in terms of like, where does this associate with, with England in particular? It should be noted that England isn't just, again, importing various musical styles from the continent. England is an innovator. <coughs> um, one particular instance, of course, is Ars Nova. Even though this tradition begins in Italy, and France in the in the 14th century. In England, it develops its own distinctive sort of flavor. And you have examples, say, for example, of the uh, English Franciscan friar, uh, Simon Tunstead, who creates the uh, the Quattro uh, Principalia Musicae. Um, but again, this is not just an isolated example either. You have this expanding into the English manner of music. And this is something I really found fascinating because I try and find some sort of trajectory a trajectory of court culture, moving away from real sort of medieval chivalry and into the sort of, you can say, almost the, the postmodern, um, early sort of modern period where there are these great, you know, the, the court of Philip III of Burgundy is a brilliant example of this, moving to the court of um, Emperor Maximilian at Innsbruck and then moving on to the court in Spain. And then, of course, you have a uh, uh, Don Quixote and the idea of almost the mythic archetype of the knight being outdated, you know, 250 years before the onset of Romanticism post the French Revolution. Um, but it's fascinating to know when we look at Edward III and the Order of the Garter and you look at the English manner of music, which is coming along with Henry V's conquest of France in the early 15th century, how all of these things make England not just a passive receiver of continental culture, but a great artistic innovator, which will then be elaborated on and built on by their continental rivals or partners. And the English manner is a, is a perfect example of this. And it, what causes, you can say, the relative decline of English culture and English music relative to the continent, the loss of the Hundred Years' War, and the total destabilizing effect of the War of the Roses, which, of course, was one of the worst sort of calamities in English history in terms of the percentage of men who were killed during that conflict. And so there's already been a shift by the beginning of the 16th century away from choral music into a secular form of music. And it should be noted, again, Henry VIII isn't just some barbarian. Henry VIII is a cultivated man who almost likes to consider himself like the, 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 the uh, archetypal Renaissance man during yeah. the Renaissance. And of course, he is a not just it, 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 can he play music, but he's also responsible for musical composition. However, I can't help but feeling this point that you have been emphasizing, D, which is it's transitioning. Music in this country is transitioning away from the sacred choral traditions which are associated with the monasteries and that particular architecture as well. And it's turning into something else. Say, for example, we look at uh, William Byrd and the composers mm. of Elizabeth I. Yes, all Lando Gibbon. I mean, I, I, I especially uh, love, love that period. Um, so we're not necessarily talking about, again, we're, talk, we're talking about a culture in transition, but elements of it, a fundamental element of it, essentially a limb has been cut off. 
but the culture still survives and it's going through that transformation. And regarding talking about that, going back to the architecture, you sent me a selection of images. Is there any particular order you would like me to go through them? No, uh, I just want to talk about, uh, again, an aspect of music for, before we move, move <laughs> back there. I mean, yes, you, you, oh, I was going to say, I mean, Henry VIII was, was notably composed uh, music and you can, I have three or four recordings of, of, uh, of, his, <laughs> of his songs. I mean, they, they're they almost all um, either dance, you know, as was popular at the period, uh, Renaissance dance music, or um, most of them are secular songs as well. I mean, they have lyrics, you know, uh, where, 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 where to should I express my inward heaviness? I mean, you know, brilliant rhymes like that. You, know, you, can't, you can't resist, but uh, <laughs> you, you can listen to uh, Henry VIII's music. Uh, there, there are recordings of it. Um, but, you know, the very dark thing, is that one of the worst victims of the disillusion was English music, specifically English church music, because uh, the repository for much of that, the recorded, uh, you know, the record, the, the, the re music recorded in manuscript, were the religious houses and, and monasteries and and um, churches, priories, and such. Um, you know that's where the, the you know the, this legacy was kept in the form of you, you know of of, of uh, uh, musical notation written in manuscript. But the the problem, of course, was that it was all manuscripts. Almost none of it had been printed. Uh, you know this was a uh, not you know not terribly long after the kind of wide uh, dissemination of of, of 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 printing, and so. Uh, Almost, I, I, in fact, I think probably none of this music at that time had been printed. And when the disillusion came, one of the victims, well, you know, one of the, the great victims were the, were the libraries of these places. Because, of course, mm. all any of these people who ransacked uh, the, these, these, these religious buildings, all they cared about were materials which could be, you know, as we said, useful to them. Um, some of these books had precious bindings, and so those were quickly stripped off. Uh, but almost no one cared about the actual contents of these manuscripts. And, and by manuscript, I mean, again, had, had been written physically by a scribe onto pages made of vellum or parchment. Now, these weren't paper books at, mm. that, at that time. All, all the books would have been, uh, you know, treated animal hides. Just, so, for, just for a point of reference, it should be noted that the uh, Gutenberg Press wasn't invented until just a few years before the dissolution. Yeah, I mean, very, very soon after. You know, you get the in incunabular period, you know, prior to 1500, and then, you know, not long after this came. So, yeah, there was no, no time for anything to be printed. And so what happened to the books? Well, they were vellum. And so they were... Many of them, I hate to, I hate to even say it, but there's there's records from the time of, of some of the men who acquired these these lands using the, the pages to shine their boots. Um, many of them were sold to uh, to be, you know, because they were parchment vellum, they could be um, melted down and, and made into glue. And uh, unfortunately, that was the uh, that was the fate of most of these. And so most English church music from prior to the dissolution is gone. It's lost. It was lost forever. Um, so that entire, you know, other than what was passed along and, of course, recorded later on, you know, because some of these things had, you know, were within the memory of, uh, you know, people who, who use this music within the worship service. But uh, but much of it was, was, was completely lost. So, yeah, Eng English music, uh, was basically destroyed uh, for the most part with with the dissolution because all these books were just uh, were just destroyed and I had a quick um, statistic you know about two places uh, Worcester Priory uh, had about six hundred books at the time of the dissolution there are only six of them known to survive today mm -hmm. um, the Augustinian Friars at York had a library of six hundred forty six volumes. Uh, most of them were literally destroyed. They were burned or, or stripped and sold uh, again to be rendered. And there's only three that survive today. Uh, and um, 
So there was not only the loss of sacred objects and materials, but there was a loss of knowledge. You know, there was the literal destruction of music and history and, you know, all sorts of things, religious religious thought, you know, uh, completely destroyed and lost forever, never to be reclaimed. So, I mean, that is, is I think, one of the one of the worst aspects of this. And, and this thank period. you for that, Dean. Of course, it's the it's the counterpart to the destruction of the buildings themselves, the destruction of everything inside. So, regarding your images, I have a, a, a an order. I think perhaps it would be best to talk about this one first, which is the fate of Henry VIII and the succession plans unmade. I assume that's uh, what's going on here with yeah. The, uh, <laughs> This is this is an odd um, this is an odd piece of propaganda. It's uh, uh, it's it's a it's a picture known as King Edward the the sixth and the Pope. Uh, and you can see Edward the sixth, Henry's Henry Henry's only surviving male heir. Um, mm. in the in the in you know in the sort of center place of the picture, you see Henry on the left, you know, on his deathbed, basically pointing to Edward as his successor. This was painted about uh, 1575. There's no date on it, but there's been a dendrochronologic analysis, which basically involves l looking at the wood. You, you, you can date pictures that are painted on wooden panels by doing an analysis, uh, analysis of the wood. So this is about 1575. Um, and also you see that beneath Edward VI feet is Pope you know, being crushed and the <clears throat> you see some monks being driven away, uh, but also notably in the upper right hand corner is an image of the this orgy of destruction. You know, you see, you see men pulling down, uh, uh, you know, pu pu pulling down um, icons and wrecking buildings and burning things in the background. Um, and of course, Edward the Sixth, I would say, in his very short life and reign. Um, was more of a ideological Protestant, certainly than his father ever was. You know, I mean, this this never had a chance to really amount to much because, of course, uh, you know, he died quite quite soon after. But uh, you know, this this picture was sort of presenting the idea that he was going to bring on a true, the true sort of Reformation spirit. Uh, so, God forbid, <laughs> what would have happened? had he had he lived uh but that's what this uh this painting is it's in the national portrait gallery in london if, if uh, you want to have a look at it well it's arguable that um edward the sixth was probably the most puritanical protestant yeah. english king we've ever had um especially in the context of the times he lived in but of course edward the sixth again to a great extent e even though he if you look at his diaries um, he does have a considerable amount of autonomy, despite the fact he became king when he was nine and he died when he was 15. He was under the influence, of course, of Thomas Cranmer. Mm -hmm. Thomas Cranmer was the Archbishop of Canterbury who officiated over the divorce, who facilitated the creation of the Church of England in 1534, or rather you can say the unshackling of the Church of England in 1534, depending on your view. And really, it seems post-1549, Thomas Cranmer is just unleashed, um, along with the House of Seymour, uh, his, his you know, maternal ancestors, uh, who are basically controlling him and uh, access to him. So, yes, I think in that time, it's interesting, however, that this Protestant revolution coincides with the Catholic restoration with Mary, but as I've already sort of gone into the dissolution of the monasteries was so total and the social effects of it were so significant that it was a self-coup on the Tudor monarchy and a demonstration that no matter how much Mary could have tried and had she lived longer and had she produced a son, the Reformation, the effects of it were already irreversible at this point. Yeah, But this comes on to some images of English country houses. We've already had a couple of reference by, by Rick. So would you like to go into these? Uh, sure. I'll talk about them. These are a bit unrelated from what we've been talking about. Um, uh, we, we've sort of mentioned 
the uh, spirit of him. By the by the way, of course, uh, Cramner also <laughs> things ended badly for him as well. So, uh, as, well, as I, I, I feel someone. a bit. I feel a bit. Um sorry for Cranmer in many ways. For people who don't know, Cranmer, of course, was the Archbishop of Canterbury. When Mary came in, uh, Stephen Gardner didn't replace him as Archbishop of Canterbury, but he was supplanted in religious authority. Mm. Uh, He was sent to the Tower. Uh, He was ordered to recant and basically say everything he did during the Reformation was wrong and that uh, Catholicism was the true religion, etc. And then he was, regardless of his recantation, he was still sentenced to be burned alive along with the um, the Protestant martyrs. So it should be noted then that having been sentenced despite his recantation, uh, he then recanted the recantation just before being, being killed. So mm. in, in many ways, there was some sort of uh in city it wasn't a it wasn't a good <laughs> it was heroic death in all yes of, it, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't a uh yeah it was it wasn't a, sh- a moment of schadenfreude i'm afraid no um uh, so well uh, yeah what we're looking at here is this is burley house um and uh, i i put this in as an example of of this sort of um I would say, you know, if you're looking for something post the post Gothic period, uh, in the very early days of this sort of transition from sacred to secular architecture, I mean, there was this sort of wonderful period uh, prior to the advent of Palladianism and and associated kind of um, importations. There was this wonderful kind of flourishing of. I would call the, the sort of English Renaissance uh, style, and uh, you know, I, I'm I'm quite fond of of this uh, of this type of architecture. Of course, it's not again not it, it's in a very different spirit, and you start to see the kind of um, symmetrical uh, nature of uh, you know the, these buildings, and you you start to see the sort of advent of uh, later developments, but. Uh, you know, they're they're still quite quite wonderful, and and I think that really the last gasp of of anything that could be called a kind of truly English, mm. uh, uh, again architectural settlement uh, before, you know, before the, uh, you know, before the, <clears throat> uh, again the Palladian um, period period came in. So and and Burley was built um, by. Uh, William Cecil, um, uh, who was, of course, the um, what was he, the treasurer, Lord High Treasurer, or something? Who, yes, uh, uh, Lord yeah. Burley. The uh, I, I believe, yes, he was the Lord High Treasurer, or, or the or the Chancellor. I can't quite remember, but yes, he was effectively the Chief Minister of Elizabeth throughout almost the entirety of her reign until uh, she actually replaced him with her son. Uh, if I remember, was Robert Cecil. Robert. who facilitated the Stuart succession yeah uh and so this this was a uh, the residence of the Cecil for uh, um I can't remember if it's it, when, when it sort of passed uh no no it's still it's still it's still uh, partially retained by the by the descendants of the Cecil so but it was built in um about 1555 uh 55 to 85 i would say um and it was it was modeled on richmond uh palace the old richmond palace which has been demolished but um uh but it's a wonderful place to visit if you ever uh uh, get a chance it's um you you know a a quintessential i would say example of uh, of this uh of this English Renaissance period that I'm I'm so fond of, and I mean there's other other uh, other buildings as, as we mentioned. Uh, but, but in terms uh, of an enduring legacy of monarchy, I mean of nobility rather. I mean I I came back. I want to come back to that original quote from Disraeli at the beginning about the idea of the the Chatworths and the Longleats, etc., and this being the recompense to some extent for the Reformation. And it is an enduring monument to the English aristocracy. In particular, you mentioned the House of Cecil, but of course they would have a very long arm and 
I would argue, perhaps the last really great prime minister of the United Kingdom, the Marquis of Salisbury, was, of course, a Robert Cecil. Robert Cecil, yeah. Uh, indeed. And, uh, you know, and... Um, and of course, it's 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 you know it, I think it's wonderful that it's still you know the the it's still under the control of the family. Uh, this is um, Hardwick Hall, which I think many people uh, may may recognize. Very famous uh, building of this this period, most notable, I, I, I well, often noted for its extensive use of glass windows, uh, much m much more much. Uh, much more extensive use of, uh, of 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 windows than I think any house before this period, um, mm. and it was built in um, I, I think the fifteen nineties uh, for uh, uh, the Countess of Shrewsbury, who was known as um, um, Bet Bess of Hardwick. Uh, in fact, you can see on the on the um, uh, the, t the top of each of the uh, the sort of um, towers at the, at the edges of the, of the structure it, you can see the letters es for elizabeth shrewsbury um so this was a really uh expensive building for the time um and uh, a wonderful built building to visit I, again i see this as another step away from yeah. um a kind of british uh you know true british renaissance vernacular but still within that tradition uh this building also was so I said earlier that we didn't really think of architects, you know, prior to to kind of the the 16th century. You know, you, you didn't really have you, know, you had, and in fact, people weren't even referred to as architects. I mean, the person in that role would have been called a surveyor um, generally, and that was the word that was used until much later when architect became the, the the kind of appellation for mm -hmm. the, for the designer of building. Uh, but this was. Uh, the, you know, the ostensible architect of Hardwick Hall was uh, a, a man by the name of Robert Smithson. That's Smithson with Y. Um, and he was a stonemason. I mean, the origin of architecture would have been people who had uh, a great familiarity with the material process of actually making a structure. Um, so he was a stonemason and designed this building. And also, uh, we met you mentioned Longleat. Uh, we were talking about a bit about that before the stream. Longleat was also mostly his construction. In fact, he carved, you know, by himself, carved a lot of the um, exterior ornamentation at Longleat, uh, um, the the oldest part of it. So, um, so yes, this this would be example of of a, of a building that's really on the kind of transition between, you know, that that the old sense of English um, in English style and uh, sort of uh, a more of a continental view, and also I think notable because it marks again the transition from the sacred to the secular, and we of course see the rise of you know of of names. You know, I mean, again, if you think of the medieval period, as I said, so much of the artistic work, you know, it was not created by it was it the the, cr the creator of the work wasn't the focal point. So of course we don't know who mostly the illuminators we don't know most of the the names of most of the people who you know who did the wonderful you know panel paintings and all the pieces and icons um we don't know the names of people who designed uh, and supervised the building of of all of the the monasteries and churches and cathedrals of the past but of course with the renaissance we start that the the creator the artist you know the uh starts to be a, a figure you know rather than and the fo so the focus is of course on the creator rather than mm. the creator of, of everything god you know so uh, so we know of course robert smithson's name and uh, and he would be a very early example of a you know of an english architect of of in the modern sense well it's not just the names <clears throat> of the architects but it's also the names of the inhabitants mm. in the same way that again the churches it's not just the home of a particular line of abbots, etc. Um, these are also the creation of these new aristocratic dynasties. And I have to always recontextualize this in the sense that Elizabeth didn't actually build any palaces herself. Yeah. All of these great country houses were 
the rewards, the demonstrations of this new settlement between the monarchy and the nobility built on the supremacy and built out of the ruins of the church structure following the dissolution. And this is where we have the advent of the sort of the Lord adventurer going out and conquering a part of Ireland or going out and uh, discovering Virginia, as was the case with, uh, with Walter Raleigh. So it really is the beginning of a new age based on the vestiges of the previous style. Essentially, the previous <laughs> style stands, if anything, as a foundation for this creation of this fundamentally new conception of England post the dissolution as a result of the reconfirmation of the Henrikian settlement through the Elizabethan mm. settlement. And Indeed. here, of course, uh, oh, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, one, one yeah. more thing about Hard, Hardwick Hall, and I think it, uh, as as, Vinch, you know, as um, evidenced by uh, your point, is that <laughs> you can't look at look at it without seeing ES, without seeing the, the initials of the, mm. you know, of, of the person for whom it was, it was built. You know, it's, it's right in your face. You're, you're never meant to, you're never meant to forget this was a monument uh, by the second richest woman in England behind the Queen at the time. Uh, uh, extraordinarily wealthy. Um, also, very quickly, what happened. So this Hardwick Hall became um, the property of the Devonshires, uh, of the Dukes of Devonshire. And I believe when the 10th Duke died in the 1950s, um, in lieu of the punishing death duties, uh, Owed to uh, HM revenue, uh, they they gave Hardwick Hall to the National Trust. You know, I mean, it's talk. You know, again, in, in a weird way, there was a kind of twentieth century mini dissolution of the, you know, the the great landowners and you know holders of all these great country properties. You know, most of their kind of estates were you know we're, we're ruined by taxation you know and 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 they had to sell off and partial pop partition off and parcel out bits and pieces of their land you know and in such in such you know some, some of these families live in a small apartment within some of these great houses the rest of it being given over to tourism and managed by the national trust so it, it is a, a weirdly ironic thing that uh you know that that, that the descendants of of some of the beneficiaries of the dissolution would also have their, you know, have their their great monuments to themselves taken away. No, I I, I completely agree with you. It's it's only fitting, you know, uh, sick transit Gloria Mundi and to be again the victims of their own dissolution in terms of this being a temporal conception of power. These being buildings meant to project power and project power associated with people, not with abstract ideas or the concept of God. Just again, as a, as a parallel to um, Cecil, the Duke of Devonshire's were, of course, um, famous supporters of the Whig Party. In fact, one Duke of Devonshire, I think twice, actually, two Dukes of Devonshire were on the cusp of being prime ministers. Uh, the latter one, around the same time that uh, Robert Cecil, the Marquis of Salisbury, was entering into politics and was later going to be prime minister. So uh, interesting, again, the currents of these aristocratic houses through history. So um, mm. we've talked about the music, we've talked about the architecture, and here's an example of the pre-dissolution art, of course. I've already cited this image um, yeah. in a previous lecture when I was comparing Charles I to Richard II. The episode is called Monarch Martyrs. Check that out. One, um, wonderful, but, uh, wonderful uh, episode, by the way. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. But uh, what would you like to say about this image? Well, I included the Wilton diptych because it's one of the few surviving english uh panel paintings uh from the you know the entire medieval period you know it's 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 it's, it's very strange to say that of course because if you go to you know any sort of decent museum gallery you, you, you're going to see a lot of kind of altarpieces you know private altars panels of, the, of this nature but of course they will be a generally italian there's some French ones as well, and a few others. Um, almost none, none of them are English because most of them didn't survive. Again, this was something that had no value at all to the records of the, uh, you know, of the the monasteries. Um, and so, any of these sort of objects that, you know, and and most of them would have been 
most of them would have, would have resided in, in, in these religious uh, houses. Uh, you know, they were just, um, they were tossed aside. Some of them were scraped, I mean, literally scraped for the gold. And 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 keep in mind that there's just a, a, a you know, an almost imperceptible amount of gold on these things. So that, that uh, the desperation there, and also for the blue pigments and the red pigments, lapis, ultramarine, and uh, vermilion. But, uh, and then they were thrown away. All the wood was used for something else, or they were cut down you know, and kind of inserted in as decorative panels into things. But uh, the, the the Wilton diptych is all is is almost one of the only ones to survive, and and probably only survived because it was, of course, a private altar, uh, and so was not, you know, was 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 safe uh, uh, from from you know from from the the pillage of that period. Uh, well, almost, well, almost remarkably, so of course, another image that survives is, of course, the coronation painting portrait of Richard II, which mm. in terms of images evoking power was gratuitously large and was meant to evoke that that sense of awe and majesty. And of course, Richard II communicated this blossoming, um, not just English, but continental culture through the English court, through the use of images. And it's happenstance that uh, you bring the Bolton Diptych up as an example of the pre-dissolution art, but nevertheless, it seems fortuitous because situated on the left, we have the patron saints of the kneeling, um, eternally young um, King Richard II. Of course, we have um, uh, John the Baptist, we have Edmund the Martyr, um, and we have Edward the Confessor. And I view Richard II, I didn't actually mention this on his dedicated episode, but I almost view Richard II as reacting consciously against the innovations of his grandfather, Edward III in France, the idea of the king as being the warrior king and adopting St. George as the patron saint, the idea, of course, of George slaying the dragon. And instead, he opts for these earlier iterations of martyrdom and uh, Christian sacrifice and suffering in the case of the saint kings of England, not only to buttress the dynasty and his own right to rule, but also to emphasize the role of peace. And of course, this is shown in the, the third panel, um, the, the second one uh, from the right, with his reorganization of the coat of arms, which was inherited from Edward III, who decided to add the fleur-de-lis to the three lions of England. And here we have the adoption of the doves of Edward the Confessor, so as to emphasize that piece. But I bring it up because the Wilton Diptych encapsulates, in my mind, this veneration of pre disillusioned England towards these national saints, which were invariably linked and associated with the monastic life, which was uprooted and destroyed. Yes, in indeed. Uh... Um, and and of course, this is an extraordinarily fine picture. I mean, this was uh, painted for Richard. You know, he was the donor, and, and generally, you, you tell you can tell in in these donor portraits because the donor will be will be kneeling before uh, the Virgin and, and Christ. Uh, as well, of course, Richard. the Virgin in here is also his wife, Anna Bohemia, who posture who sort of posthumously assumed a a role of the Virgin Queen in a chaste union because they were never able to produce children. Mm. Um, and uh, just to give people an idea, this, this is, it's called a diptych. A diptych is, is a painting done in, in two panels, generally of the same size. And, and this is hinged. So what you're seeing on the left is the inside of it. And what you're seeing on the right are the, is the back, basically the, the, the outside. It, it's basically two, two pieces of wood painted on both sides. And it's hinged so that it can be closed to protect the paint painting on the interior. So the, uh, uh, the the um the uh, uh, iconography uh, the uh, heraldic iconography on is on the out, uh, outer part of the panel, which is why it's much more damaged. You know, the interior of the painting is in fairly good condition. The outside is is quite damaged because, of course, it would have remained closed uh, much of the time. So, right. <laughs> Uh, I just threw this in for fun, uh, just you know, I, I, for a, a, an example of an English, um, a domestic English architecture uh, that would have um, that would have preceded the dissolution. You know, uh, 
again, this was the this was a this was a fairly grand house. I mean, again, not not on the scale of the things we saw later on. This is called Little um, Little Morton Hall, uh, and um, I've, I've got to look the date up because I never remember dates for anything. Um, not even my own birthday. Uh, <laughs> little, little Morton Hall. Uh, yeah, it was fi about fifteen uh fifteen oh four to fifteen oh eight. Uh, and it's in Cheshire. Well, it's it's uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's in Cheshire. And and again, this would have been the kind of um, the kind of semi grand architecture that would have been, that would have coexisted with the England of the monastery. You know, um, so you get a you get a very good sense about how comparing this to a sort of grandiose pile like Hardwick Hall, how how that perception change and of course uh, uh this uh kind of gingerbread um style of of, of uh beam and um plaster building you know is is, is very much associated with this period uh, but I, I i love this i mean i you know i i'm very much an advocate of this sort of um architecture which is partially vernacular and in, in sort of entirely organic you know again this this is less something that came out of the kind of careful uh plan of an architect and more more of something that grew out of the uh, of the kind of intuitive uh, understandings of the builder in fact the builders well, i mean not the builder but um the uh person who made the windows actually carved his name uh, above one of them so uh, I, it's not a visible in the picture but yeah but above one of these magnificent uh gabled windows is uh, carved Richard Dale Carbider made this window by the grace of God uh, which is very unusual to have again a name uh, but uh, but I, I very much love this house and again you, you can visit you can visit it and, and see um the, the the wonkiness that you notice you can see the great hall at the top it, it's it's not <laughs> There aren't many parallel lines in this building, but that would all, all been because the building over the past 500 years has, has settled in various ways. But uh, yeah, a, a, a good example of uh, uh, the domestic architecture of the pre dissolution And this is Nonsuch, uh, which was a palace built for uh, Henry VIII. Uh, he never saw it completed it was not completed within his life um there are very few there's only a couple of contemporary depictions of it um i believe it was pulled down in the late 17th century uh, i'm not entirely sure about that i think 1683 okay uh and uh you know of course henry the eighth was unlike his his daughter Elizabeth was a uh, a fairly profligate builder of uh, of, of of palaces and uh, uh, dwellings. So, uh, uh, but yeah, th this is a, a really. I mean, uh, you you can look. There's other, you know, sort of more recent kind of reconstructions of it, um, and you can see how sort of you know it's a really fanciful thing i mean it's so much of it is apply is is applied decoration i mean this is an example a completely the opposite example of, of the kind of uh palladian of uh, uh, geometric palladianism that would come later on you know this idea of you know where the, the form and the structure are kind of the the thing that impresses you about this i mean this is in, is almost a a kind of confection where the the structure is is hidden behind this extraordinarily uh, ornate uh, decoration, um, it really is remarkable. I mean, without actually having the physical building still existing, it's almost fantastical. You can you can barely conceive of this being real. I mean, it's almost Ludwigian, Ludwig of Bavaria, in terms yeah. of the, uh, <laughs> the, the just the pure imagination being crafted into this building, and how again it is so unusual in terms of everything that succeeds it. I mean, it's even unusual given 
the palace which is most often associated with Henry VIII, which wasn't actually his own palace, it was Cardinal Wolsey's palace, which of course is Hampton Court. Yeah. But this really does seem like some sort of uh, gothic ideal placed in the extreme. And even the, because uh, it's hard to tell again, even the um, the domes here, <laughs> they're very reminiscent of the, the domes of Brighton Pavilion almost. Yeah, yeah. Or they, they're, 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 there certainly is an echo there. Uh, and of course, I like I like that as well. I mean, I tend to prefer, and and one of the reasons why I like you know what I would call the native you know this, this native uh, style of English slash British architecture of these periods is of course it's Ill, you know there's something slightly illogical about it. There's something you know again it, it it's it's more of an accretion. It's more of a kind of uh, a collection. Of brilliant moments, rather than a kind, uh, rather than a, a, a geometrical uh, sort of all, all over construction, you know, it, it's uh, it's almost um, anti-rational, uh, and of course, you know, um, can be said of most of the, the kind of great Gothic uh, cathedrals and buildings um, that, that that survive to this day in in, in England. Um, and and I like that, and I think that of course reached its apotheosis, and of course reached its end in the in the mid sixteenth century, and certainly ended ended with Henry the Eighth, and or at least soon after the, this sort of extremity, and and we have almost no surviving examples of this sort of thing. In fact, Hampton Court, I mean, you, you know, many people have visited Hampton Court and and you know and, be, and been you know impressed by it, but of course. There are almost no original interiors left from Hampton Court as it was built, and it was also, as with many of these palaces, when the the sort of English Renaissance came and went, a very short period. But uh, you know, you know, it was just you know had leather, you know, sort of painted leather, you know, kind of patterned interiors with velvets and fur, and you know, you know painted carvings you know encrusting every surface um you know the use of color and the use of paint in in interiors of this period is, is something that we just don't we don't have any conception of it's it's very much like this sort of idea that that all of ancient rome was was white marble you know when of course it wasn't um you know there there was there was a lost component to that you know that we you know that that, that we we sort of had to rediscover and, and indeed of course uh, some of the interiors from this period have been rediscovered. I, I know at Hampton Court uh, fairly recently they they found uh, hidden underneath layers and layers and layers of things. Of course, uh, you know some some vestiges of uh, of the way it it, it looked, the, the way that certain rooms looked. Um, so yeah, I mean this this sort of insane, illogical, ir irrational kind of ornamentated exuberance, you know, which was a you know, uh, an extension of, of of the English Gothic, uh, I think had its had its final flourishing and end uh, with uh, with Henry VIII. So um, his legacy wasn't entirely destructive, but of course, almost nothing remains of it. Well, well no, it's it's interesting. I, I really want to build on this point because it, this could be said to be one of the last ever Gothic buildings in the English style. And I, I want to emphasize this because it really underlines what we've both been saying this entire stream is that the happenstance and almost tragic and materialistic nature of the disillusion, because there's nothing about Henry VIII that paints him as an iconoclast or some sort of religious fanatic bent on burning things down. I really do think of Henry VIII as almost a tragic figure in the mm. sense that had he had different counsel, had he been a king in a different time, this wouldn't have manifested in the way it did. And if anything, this is the perfect illustration that he is an icon or jewel rather than iconoclast. But it's also interesting to point in terms of the styming, the petrification, the re-debasing of the English style and its ultimate extinction. Because compare this with what happened in France. In France, of course, the great rival of Henry VIII in everything, not just in war, but also in terms mm. of culture and letters, was King Francis. And King Francis had his own equivalent of Nonsuch, which was the glorious, and still stands today as opposed to Nonsuch, the Chateau de Chambord. 
the Chateau de Chambord is iconic in terms of building up the French Renaissance style, which will continue well into the late 17th century. There are just it, there are many, many iterations of this. I mean, my particular, my, my favorite iteration of the French Renaissance style is the Chateau de Chenonceau. But then you have other iterations of it, say, for example, the Mary de Medici wings of the Louvre Palace, and then by extension, the Louis XIII wings. And then, of course, we develop into the sort of late styles of Louis XIV, etc. But that's another conversation. But for now, French Gothic architecture is succeeded by something else, which if you look at Chateau de Chambord, you look at Chateau de Chamonceau, you look at these structures and you cannot think that they are intrinsically French. More, probably more so, more obviously, than even Gothic examples of English architecture. So just to emphasize the petrification of English architecture and the blossoming of French royal architecture, which of course did go through its own iteration of a reformation, though of a very different kind. So just in terms of trying to attach an epilogue to this and what happens in the next couple of centuries in terms of this architectural transition, You've already mentioned Palladio, and the Palladian style comes from Venice, I believe. Um, it's not just Venetian styles also, but it's the Roman styles associated with the, the Tridentine reform, I would debase and call it the Counter-Reformation, in terms of the, particularly around the construction, reconstruction of St. Peter's Basilica, beginning with Julius II, but it's a project that encompasses much of the 16th century. After the death of James I, the first Stuart King, we arrive at the reign of Charles I. And I, I want to bring this up because I really want to get your perspective on this. Charles I was a great patron of the arts, you know, him uh, together with the Earl of Arundel, um, not just in terms of the uh, the patronage of painting and the royal portrait as being intimately associated with the projection of royal power, as with Richard II. But he was also, in many ways, I, I, I kind of, it's interesting how Richard Cromwell is seen as the religious fanatic, because I believe that Charles had a far more cogent vision of the Church of England than Cromwell ever had, especially as encapsulated through the quote-unquote crypto-Catholic William Lord, which was of a grand new palace of Whitehall, again, trying to build on this legacy of Henry VIII. But of course, it was to be in the Palladian style designed by Inigo Jones. And it was to be surrounded by all of these little parish satellites, which was a new generation, a new creation of English parish churches, either the restoration of older ones or the creation of new ones to re-cement faith in the Church of England and by extension, fidelity to the person of the king, but it is using this foreign style in the form of Inigo Jones's Palladianism. Yes, and of course, uh, you know, Inigo Jones, I mean, he's sort of given the uh, the title of the, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, honorary title is the first architect in, in England, which isn't really true. <clears throat> but yes, I mean, it is notable. And it's, it's also notable that I think Charles I um, had much more of a kind of eye on, um, I don't know. I mean, I think of Henrietta Maria. I, I, I feel like there, there was a kind of uh, a sudden uh, cosmopolitan, you know, or sort of uh, 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 kind of uh, nature to the, to the court. Uh, perhaps, but uh, well, well but just, yeah, just I mean, to emphasize that, I mean, his main inspiration wasn't England; it was Spain. Uh, yeah. It was the court of Philip the Fourth of Spain, and of course, who was the greatest artist working under his patronage? It was Rubens, of course. So, yeah, we have elements of this international court culture, which again imported during Richard the Second. Richard the Second, of course, was enamoured of French styles. He was enamoured of imperial styles coming from his own connection to the the imperial house at that time so it's interesting to think that both in the case of charles the first he does represent something else and in his attempts to reform and reconsolidate the church of england the only thing he was lacking was goodwill and funds ultimately mm. it's interesting to see what could have happened as a result of this and what style could have come out of this had Charles I wanted to build like he intended to build and impress not just 
God, but the power of the Stuart dynasty throughout the kingdom. Because what happens, of course, is that doesn't happen. Charles I is removed from power during the conflagration, which is the English civil wars, where I prefer the War of the Three Kingdoms, which is very in vogue at the moment historiographically. And then we come to a next period of iconoclasm, which is the iconoclasm associated with the new model army and the religious oh. revolution associated with the Puritan soldiers um, and, of course, Oliver Cromwell. But just in defense of Oliver Cromwell, I do have to point out that he's often typified, in some cases rightly, as a religious fanatic. Yet he was a moderate for a Puritan, it should be mentioned, because within the more radical factions, of course, there is wonderfully titled the Levellers, which I think is perfectly appropriate yeah. <laughs> in terms of their vision for England. But the fanatical elements of the Puritan movement, which were associated with the new model army, not only they wanted a political revolution. They wanted not only to do away with monarchy, but they wanted to completely change the Church of England, to destroy all elements of hierarchy within it, focus purely on the congregations as basically churches within themselves. But more than that, it was on using Parliament and by extension the House of Commons as a genuine vehicle for quote unquote popular government, basically presaging yeah. what would ultimately happen. But there's another element to that, which is that radical elements of the New Model Army had no qualms in going into beautiful buildings such as King's College, Cambridge, and ransacking them and taking away all valuables. And of course, there was a military motive for that in terms of financing the war and the creation of a very large standing army, which was a complete novelty for England at that time. But there was also a religious component in the fact that Charles I and William Lord were accused of being Catholics in terms of the obsession with images. And I will completely say that this is completely true regarding regarding Charles I and the idea of the images representing the essence, the regal essence of monarchy. Mm. But of course, that is taken in the Puritan lens as sacrilege, and therefore the result of that is inevitably iconoclasm. Yes, and of course, you know, what, you know, I mean, the, the, the wave of iconoclasm that came with this importation of this pernicious uh, you know, religious ideations from the alien religious ideations from the continent, uh, you know, had also destructive effects. I mean, you, you think of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Commonwealth as the period when uh, English theatre was suppressed heavily uh, by the Puritans. Uh, when, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the first war on Christmas, you know, as people like to use that, mm. that phrase, uh, you know, th this, uh, this sort of, um, th this sort of ze zealot, zealous idea of suppressing um the the various festivities that had grown up around the celebration of uh, the celebration of christmas so uh, you know and and uh, and and as you say the sacking of uh, colleges and you know, things like that uh, and of course you know, you know and and it was also the time when the english uh, monarchic m monarchical regalia was most of it was melted down and and sold so um uh, so most of the um, the regalia uh, from before that doesn't doesn't exist. Crowns from you know I, I can't even remember the the specific uh, crowns and scepters and things that had, uh, that were uh, that were scrapped and sold by uh, by Cromwell and and the uh, uh, and the and the Commonwealth. But that that also happened during that period. So yeah, this is, was a sort of uh, a second bubbling up of this impulse and and much more ideological this time. You know, it was it was uh, it was less the opportunistic, you know, raiding by um, mater you know, materialistic yeomen, and more the kind of uh, uh, ideologically inspired zealotry uh, in the case. Well, well could you imagine? Possible. Could you imagine Cromwell had Oliver Cromwell been there instead of Thomas Cromwell, who was in fact a distant relation, in terms of combining that bureaucratic zeal? to appropriate wealth and consolidate the power of the monarchy combined with that religious zeal as well and attacks on monastic life. It's interesting, however, to consider that the happenstance dissolution of the monasteries, which was, like I said, an, an orgy of self-interest, mm. 
and destroying again one of the worst episodes of english history in terms of our national shame and then imagine and then it's interesting to consider that the iconoclasm that came after that was significantly lesser in terms of the order of destruction because yeah. the greater dissolution had already occurred at that point there was only so much damage they could do yeah and uh, yeah you're 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 right but i i think they i mean hand in hand of course combined the 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 results of both of these periods were, you know, were, but but you know, it, it, it's it's you can also look at when what what went on in terms of iconoclasm on the continent in the Netherlands, for instance, and uh, you know, in a much more or, or in Calvin's Geneva, you know, or at the behest of Calvin, and um, I can't remember the other the other person who was really associated with that movement, but uh, um. So, so yes, obviously, and, and of course, as you say, I mean, Charles the First was not only the a, a great uh, sort of proponent of the idea of the image, you know, promulgating the image of the monarch and the monarchy, but but also he was the first uh, person to bring a significant amount of art uh, into England, into Britain, from from elsewhere. You know, I mean. Obviously, there was there was also an international influence on Henry VIII's court because, of course, he had Hans Holbein as mm. as as the court, you know, portraitist and and painter. And of course, uh, there were commissions from Henry and of course many many of the courtiers. Of, of, and of course, Thomas Cromwell. And of course, Thomas Cromwell. And and magnificent portraits survive of of, of many of these figures. I mean, we we know their faces, and the, and the, and of course, you know, because of Holbein's um, sort of divine abilities, you know. We, they, they, they're the, the Tudors of the, many of the figures from the Tudor period. Are, they're really sort of human. They seem very human. They, uh, the, those portraits are so alive in a certain way. Um, and, and the same with Charles the First, of course, because he had Antony of Antony Van Dyck, um, who served the, the same role. Um, he he had other painters. Um, I can't remember the. Uh, uh, the chap who who preceded uh, Van Dyck as the as the favoured painter of uh, Charles the First, but it was very 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 apparent uh, that that Van Dyck would be the would be the choice when he when he came on the scene. Um, also, well, but it's not just that. I mean, we're, we're talking about music as well. Um, I believe Charles the First was the first English king to actually create an equivalent of a Kapellmeister. Mm. the master of the king's music which was given to uh, william laws and again we have an associated sort of court tradition of music you mentioned already orlando gibbons um but then we later on we talk about thomas Tompkins, who was slightly earlier than this period but no. already there is this attempt to cultivate not, not just music in the court culture but an official patronage for royal music with william laws mm. in in the in indeed um yeah, so uh... there's just one last interesting point, which is you mentioned Palladianism. It should be emphasized here that there are two Palladianisms because the first one was so associated with the Carolingian, sorry, the monarchy of Charles I, that it became discredited quite soon after. It wasn't in vogue at all, obviously, during the Commonwealth. But when we come back to the restoration of Charles II, so we're talking and James II, so we're talking 1660 to 1688. England go through, goes through another cultural architectural phase, which is the English Baroque, a very brief period of the English Baroque, yeah. which is mostly associated with one figure in terms of architecture, Christopher Wren. Christopher um, Wren. In addition to creating these beautiful buildings like the Maritime Hospital at Greenwich and you know, various edifices associated with Oxford. And his crowning achievement, of course, being St. Paul's. But in terms of the architecture, it is very reminiscent of the Cathedral, the Duomo in Florence, and by extension, yeah. St. Peter's Basilica. Yeah. But there is also his musical counterpart in terms of Henry Purcell. So oh. really, I'd like to get your perspective on both of these men. Well, so in terms of Christopher Wren, I mean, I, you know, I, I have mixed feelings. I mean, obviously, you know, we, we all know the extent to which Wren uh influenced the rebuilding of uh of london after the great fire 
and uh, of course his influence was uh, you know was in, in, enormous um he, he did other things as well i mean he was also um he was also in, associated with the establishment of the royal society and, and such um so um but you know again i have mixed feelings because of course his the advent of wren and and his his rebuilding of london of, of london from medieval london to the the seeds of what would become modern london it's a step towards planning. It's a step towards the kind of total management and the kind of schematic schematization of what had been, and again, this this sort of organic medieval design of a city. And, and mm. whilst some of that was retained, you know, there was also this again this move towards a central plan. And I think that the idea of the central plan is so sort of counter to the english spirit you know of of this sort of english spirit of architecture that i've uh, you know i've come to identify um so so i'm, I'm i have a very mixed feelings about about wren for that reason um i'm much actually in, in in terms of that period i'm much more interested in nicholas hawksmore who was mm. uh you know who was who who worked for wren and and who uh uh is is especially notable for the many churches that he designed that still remain right um, uh, throughout London, so Mary Woolmouth and uh, Bloomsbury, and uh, you, you know you, you you can you can look them up. I mean, you know, and again, I think that there's a bit more of well, a, well, I the, think of sort of I think of Clarendon Building, and it's um mm. it, it is sort of remarkable in terms of being. <laughs> Isn't he also responsible for the refurbishment of Westminster Abbey? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, I don't know to what extent he, uh, he, 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 you know, his his influence was felt there. But um, yeah, let me let me just check. Let me just check something. Let me just sort of see. Because I, I find it difficult to associate any sort of. Um... I don't know pattern in terms of Hawksmoor's architecture. Again, that's maybe as a result of my lack of learning. But um, his churches, in particular, I mean, it—I I can't see uh, virtually anything in terms of the association with the English styles of what we've. Um, well, what I what I what I see in that is that there's an idiosyncratic nature of of these buildings, and there's some very mm. strange there's some very strange decisions made. Uh, in certain of, of, of these buildings with with both the decoration and the kind of layout um which you know is a bit a bit much for me to get into here because i had to sort of look into it again because i i terrible uh, with, with, with names and dates and, and such but uh, you know if you um and I've, I've i've got the list here there's i mean there's six of them, six of them so uh yeah st mary walnut st luke's old street Christchurch, spitalfields st anne's limehouse st george in the east um, St George Bloomsbury, of course, which has a remarkable kind of beasts crawling about its tower, um, and which which appears in uh, several of Hogarth's famous etchings, including uh, Gin Lane and Beer Street. Uh, um, but um, but yeah, I think it's a vestigial relationship to uh, at best. I mean, I'm not saying that these are any way a sort of continuation, uh, because they're 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 also very much. Uh, generally in the in kind of Wren's um but, but sort of Wren's Baroque conception of of architecture, especially church architecture. But the, I would say there's traces of, of this sort of idiosyncrasy that I like uh, and that I associate with the you know with the older architecture. And and, and of course um yeah uh oh saying um yeah yes uh, uh westminster abbey uh i believe that um he yes he was the surveyor of, of westminster abbey and of course uh the the west tower was uh planned by him but it was not built until after hawksmore's death so, mm. so he was responsible for the for, for the west towers that of course are, are, are now very famous as the you know, in, in people's imagination of Westminster Abbey, they didn't exist before uh, before this period. Um, yeah, and, and Clarendon Building and uh, King William Block, uh, Greenwich Hospital. Yeah, you know. um, I mean, there but, is something. Uh, that, I mean, there is something to be said. I mean, I have always 
love Christopher Wren. And in, in fairness to city planning, I almost view London as, <laughs> you can say, the worst of both worlds in terms of the lack of a central plan and the complete idiosyncratic nature of the various sort of amalgamations of architecture. I would prefer if there had been some sort of Victorian iteration of the Houseman reforms, <laughs> which is is almost what happened with uh, the Great Fire of London in 1666 and the attempt to build throughout the rest of Charles II's reign. And I do, there's this... Um, there's this fantastical sort of image by it's during the high Gothic revival. So is it, I think it's Charles Cockrell and it's, it's basically London had Wren been the sole architect. And I do have a particular sort of nostalgia for that iteration of London that we could have got, but mm. never did, even though again, it is, but, but again, I, I look at the, the English Baroque and I don't just see, you know, church, um, uh, churches even even just across the channel say for example the uh very rich baroque tradition of the spanish netherlands during the 17th century let alone um any sort of fusion with the, the distinct sort of uh valedilid spanish styles of the, the 16th century moving on from humanism or el escorial i see something i see something distinct in ren's architecture which isn't just reminiscent of St. Peter's Basilica, even though one is immediately drawn to that. And it seems equivalent in terms of like an ideological foundation for it, because the idea was drawn up by Charles I, reconstructing St. Paul's Cathedral, the, the old sort of shell of St. Paul's Cathedral, and trying to build the equivalent of St. Peter's was very much in the mind of the king and the architects at that time. So I can understand why it was created as such, but I, I do sort of view it as the last great gasp before I, I don't know what I can sort of sum as a, a barren, a relatively barren sort of um, culture of neoclassicism and the second wave of Palladianism yeah. coming yeah. after the English Baroque period. So that's just my my thoughts regarding the architecture. But I really want to get your thoughts on Purcell in particular and the last flowering of an English sort of... Um, uh, compositional tradition before it is completely dominated by the likes of Handel and Handel. the German yeah. music of the 18th century. Yeah, I mean, so Purcell is, is. I mean, I, I I can't contribute any sort of technical uh, sort of discussion of Purcell, not being a, uh, a, any uh, manner of musician myself. But uh, I've always um, he's always been one of my favorite composers, and I've got um, his his complete recorded works in, 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 in many different forms. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an extraordinarily rich combination of, uh, of I would say, re religious music, but also um, kind of music in the tradition of the kind of Galliard. You know, I mean, there, there's a kind of harkening back in some of his compositions to, you know, the, the sort of music of the previous generation to him. Uh, of the viol and the you know the the dance, um, and also you know a a a, a, a large number of uh, ceremonial compositions, you know, um, and, and of course famously, you know, so, I mean, so I think some of his well, most well known compositions, the music for the funeral funeral of Queen Mary, uh, being very well known, still still used at royal funerals, but we, as we heard with uh, Her Late Majesty um, mm. Majesty's funeral a few months ago. Uh, uh, Purcell was uh, Purcell's funeral for Mary was uh, music for Mary was used. It's also the title music of uh, Clockwork Orange, you know, uh, where many people will, will have heard it. Um, and you know, he wrote other compositions, Come Ye Sons of Art, which is absolutely brilliant, um, sort of musical. Uh, um, so, so yes, I mean, you know, you know again, one of my favorites, uh. Uh, composers. Oh, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. Hail, bright Cecilia. Well, um, my my particular favorite is uh, Dido and Aeneas. Yes, Dido and Aeneas. Um, but also many, you know, many anthems and services for the church. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, a welcome to all the pleasures. Um, and I, I say celebratory music because many of these things were. <clears throat> Many of these compositions were written at, you know, sort of royal command, command um, for, you know, 
William and uh, William. Yeah, and in terms Marianne. of contextualizing him, he's mainly writing during the 1680s and the 1690s. Yeah. So he is the tail end of the Stuart Restoration and the beginning of the Glorious Restoration period. But the dominance of German culture and neoclassicism doesn't really come into effect until after the death of Queen Anne. So with with the Hanoverian <clears throat> succession, so around the year seventeen fourteen. Yes, and of course, you know, uh, and 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 you say that there was also a, a kind of second uh, advent of uh, Palladianism, which of course was um, um, was brought in by um, the the Earl of Burlington, um, the architect Earl, I think, as he was named, third Earl. Of, third, Third Earl of Burlington, um, who who sort of promulgated the 18th century uh, sort of um, revival of, of, of Bardianism, and which was of course, you know, associated with the George, you know, Georgian architecture. I mean, this is one of my sort of eternal complaints: is that many sort of people who you know, who don't have any particular knowledge of of, of the, these these periods and succession of these styles in the context of them um we'll often say well you know i want to return to kind of trad traditional architecture like you know neoclassical <laughs> georgian things and they'll they'll always pick something that looks you know, something out of that tradition and of course to me that's the the the, the absolute os opposite well, know, well i'm 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 incredibly familiar with bath um I, so I, I can agree with that i mean <laughs> on the on the one hand superficially Bath is a stupendously beautiful city, but yeah. one I, I almost look at Bath and I try and envisage the medieval core, which used to exist with the old town walls, and of course barely any of it exists. In fact, one of the most remarkable buildings in Bath is of course the Abbey, which was restored by Queen Elizabeth during the latter part of the 16th century. That that should also be a proviso for what we've been talking about, the dissolution of the monasteries, is that there was an attempt to address this through the reconsolidation of the cathedrals. The abbeys are gone, so we'll emphasize the cathedrals. And of course, Bath Abbey is called an abbey, but it is, for all intents and purposes, the twin cathedral with Wells, of course, the diocese of Bath and Wells. But what is Bath? Bath is a pleasure town. It is where one takes the waters. It is effectively, you know, the, the English equivalent of Bad Ems, which is, I forget what, what his Czech name is, I only sort of know for it through the German names. Um, so in this sense, all the architecture is rather frivolous and not really signifying anything higher. I mean, I hate to say this, but Bath or its neoclassical beauty is the late 18th century equivalent of Las Vegas. <laughs> uh okay yeah do you not agree with me there <laughs> i think maybe in spirit perhaps um, well i'm thinking know. in particular with figures such as beau nash and the uh <laughs> the rampant sort of uh gambling okay. culture that was associated there yeah right yeah i, I still st yeah i mean this is a problem of course because you know i i, I say that not particularly you know i i don't consider you know the sort of neo palladianism and Georgian architecture to be, um, you know, to be um, to my liking or you know, sort of uh, as an exemplary of English taste. But I would much rather have it, any of it than you know the the kind of current. Um, oh, I, 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 I completely, I completely agree. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> but I, I, I know what you're talking about in the the context yeah. of what we've been talking about this evening. Theoretically, yeah. I understand what you mean. I certainly agree. Um, but of course, the, you know, this was the you know this was the Georgian age. It was an it was an age of I, I would say relative frivolity uh, and 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 looseness and licentiousness and emphasis on you know material materialism and scientism and, and all of these things. So uh, and 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 of course, you know, I, I I I some of these figures that come out of that are wonderful. I mean, Robert Adam, I, I you know I quite like many of Adam's works and his interiors. You know, William William Kent capability. Brian, you know, some some of these 18th century figures are absolutely divine. And of course, you know, but again, I think uh, if you look at a larger picture and spiritually, conceptually, you know, uh, this marks just, just the sort of end, um, you know, and, and then of course you get the Victorians and all the, yeah, so uh, the 19th century. Ask. We're talking about the end. Now we're talking about romanticism <laughs> and we're talking yeah. about the reaction 
to this and the French Revolution. So yes, yeah. please go ahead. Well, I, I you know, I mean, just just saying that that, that there was a, again a brief resurgence of weirdness, you know, with with some of these some of these movements in the nineteenth century, which I, I greatly appreciate. Uh, you know, they, the the sort of um, I think the emphasis on symmetry and and uh, geometry and and you know classical proportion that came to dominate during the 18th century you know it was sort of violated again and and there was a little bit again of a a touch of that old uh english spirit in some of these bizarre confections that came up well the 19th century is remarkable because on the one hand you have the end of the 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 real supremacy with the catholic emancipation in the end of the 1820s Mm. And then that spawns, of course, the Oxford movement. You know, in the case of like John Henry Newman goes, of course, and becomes a Catholic cardinal. But in other iterations um, of the Oxford movements, those that remain within the Anglican tradition, we see the advent of high Anglicanism. It's interesting, however, to consider when figures such as William Lord are so detested in the early 17th century, how high Anglicanism of the stuff that the Puritans would have really only begun to really understand and despise only really comes into force with the emancipation of the Catholics. And you can say the partial rehabilitation of popery to some extent. Mm. And it really is accompanying the Oxford movement <coughs> that there is an architectural movement which comes with it, which is not just the restoration of the Gothic movement, but it's the restoration of a particular iteration of Gothic. I believe it's decorated Gothic. Mm. And it's not just encapsulate. I mean, there are examples of this, such as um, Gothic revivalism. We don't need to go into that tangent too much, but there are religious examples, but there are also, of course, secular examples. The, the most sort of glorious iteration of that is the Houses of Parliament themselves, which were constructed throughout the the middle of the 19th century across the um, in the place of the old building, which very much looked like um, an old chapel. Yeah. So it, it does represent a sort of an odd attempt to try and I, I, I sort of put it in comparison with, say, for example, King William the Fourth of Prussia completing Cologne Cathedral or Napoleon the uh, refurbishing Carcassonne. Um, it wasn't something particular to the English. It very much represents um, the spirit of the post French Revolution Romantic Age, which encompasses much of the 19th century before the advent of the more modernistic styles towards the end and of course it's a style which wasn't just supposed to recapture an element of this authentic english style but ironically it was an element of the english style which was then exported across the world so you have elements of the gothic revival interconnected with an attempt to fuse indian styles when you go over to the british raj and then of course you have the parliament houses in ottawa so yes very strange in terms of trying to find some sort of ideological through line to all of this yeah, and you get you yeah, and you get the very bizarre like you get the Egyptian you, you get these Egyptian uh, style things uh, as well. You know, there there's, there was a pair of sphinxes in front of the Crystal Palace and, and such. So uh, yeah, um, but I, I I I sort of ha- again have a slight fondness for that. A lot, a lot of these strange uh, these strange things that crop up uh, during that period, and and of course you know you you get something like the 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 Albert Memorial, you know, which mm. is uh, you know an absolutely bizarre, uh, but also wonderful, and it's, it's also recently been stored. Um, it's sort of completely fanciful imagining of you know the the English medieval you know spirit. Uh, so um, the English the English medieval spirit being recreated at the height of the British Empire again. It's <laughs> uh, I love these uh, again idiosyncratic moments. I mean, it's it's on the on the one hand, it's you know the age that created Gladstone. On the other, it's the one that created Thomas Carlyle. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know Macaulay and Disraeli. It's these these radical and you know Palmerston etc. These radical weak dispositions. You know the the iconoclastic puritanical liberalism yeah. and the 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 real budding of real conservatism. I, I mean that in the sort of reactionary sense, as opposed to the conservative party hmm. with those figures of the, um, the mid 19th century towards the, the end of the 19th century. And of course, this is represented in music as well, because towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, 
Purcell is back in vogue. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not sure, again, this is just a matter of taste, but I actually like um, Stokowski's uh, symphonic iterations of uh, Bach and Purcell. But mm. regarding um, the idea of an English restoration, an epilogue to this sort of period and reflecting on a petrified culture, I, I would say there was almost a Purcell mania in the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, Britain's Purcell realization seem um, like the perfect example of that. But of course, with Vaughan Williams and aspects of the Lark Ascending and his compositions, it does seem that there is an attempt to recapture this essence of Englishness in the case of Vaughan Williams and English folklore tradition. But again, the ironic thing is we're talking about English particularism, but this was also prevalent in European style. So for example, Bella Bartok wanted to do the same thing. <laughs> so mm. all of these contradictions, but what I'm trying to iterate here, again, like with, with so much of the late sort of 19th century, early 20th century conservatism, reactionary thought, there is an element, an imperfect element to recapture and arrest these certain figures, recontextualize them and bring them back and try to find some continuity. But as we see with the dissolution of the monasteries, the fundamental link is lost. If we're to think in Burkean terms, the idea of tradition, the idea of tradition is to bestow, but the caveat in terms of the, the word itself, traditore, which is also to betray, how can you preserve an unbroken link of culture where a civilization is that of the living, the dead, and those yet to be born when you have suffered through such cataclysmic, um, you know, really cultural yeah. atrocities like the dissolution of the monasteries in which something which has spawned, as you say, with the English style, organically, carefully, over hundreds, if almost a thousand years, is suddenly uprooted, and in the space of four years, it is wiped off the face of the earth, never to be recreated. Well, and it's a, it's a great warning because, of course, how, how easily the, these 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 chains forged through many many years can how quickly and easily they can be broken and never and rendered asunder and never joined again. You know, I I, I think it's a it's a le it's a lesson within. Within one generation, all of this history had been broken, uh, broken free of of the of, of those yet to be born, and and they were born, and it was it, you know, and it was lost, you know. Uh, so very quickly, things can things can uh, things can break apart. But the French uh, Revolution and, is one example yeah, of yeah. this this uh, this generational breach, which creates which creates a fundamental crisis in the organic nature of inherited tradition. <clears throat> but the other sort of element in terms of linking this back to English culture, probably the closest thing to it is the decimation of that generation during the First World War. Yeah. Um, an entire generation of men lost ultimately for, as we see with the dissolution of the monasteries, the dissolution of the monasteries ultimately yielded nothing other than the partial consolidation of a new power base. What did the what First World War mm. ultimately result in? Nothing. Was it the war mm. to end all wars? Absolutely not. Yeah, and, and, and to some degree, the Second World, World War as well. You know? um, and, you know, I, I think that we still feel, I mean, you know, we, we feel the these these you know it's like in um it's like frodo who forever you know was pained by the the, the wound he, he he got from the, the ring raids you know uh and i think that in a way our civilization is the same we're, we're, these these rifts these these cataclysmic uh sort of um happenings like the dissolution like you know uh world war one well you know we, we don't ever get over those things. And I think that we're, I mean, a lot of the kind of problems that we suffer in the modern day are, are phantom pains from these ancient wounds, you know? And I, I think that, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very difficult thing because I, I just don't think there's ever, there's, there's never a sort of way to, to come whole again. You know, part of you is, part of you is, is, is lost and lost, forever and you will feel that forever uh, as we do in our in our culture today thank you Dee. that was beautifully put so i just have to ask you um are there any sort of final thoughts you have in conclusion before i get onto the super chats about this topic 
No, I, I think that's that sort of um, summarized this. I mean, you know, I think, and people say, well, you know, <laughs> it's a very depressing stream, and it is, but you know, it's depressing because it's it's true, and you have to face the fact that you know that 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 this is a this is a legacy that we have to that we have to endure and have to figure out and have to you know ha ha hopefully learn something from. Um, but uh, you know, and again, there's bits and pieces, and I suppose the hopeful thing is that there, you know, there has been some of these things have have been at least a, a small fragment of them has been brought to light, so you can sort of uh, at least start to reimagine, you know, another another path, another trajectory, and uh, and of course with with you know music, I mean that was a huge revival in the 20th century, as you say, the revival of Purcell, and and of course then also coming out of Britain, um, and elsewhere, but certainly a big movement in Britain was, you know, the idea of um, uh, of authentic quote authentic performance, you know, this mm. this thing. Well, well, let's try to understand how the instruments of of these periods were made and how the music was performed and you know and, and try to again try to sort of revive some 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 bit of the you know the flame that it, that it had, had been snuffed out you know so you you get you know early examples of this like alfred deller and the Della Con consort and uh you know and, and, and with with mixed success but i think that that has was certainly the seed for um, a, a, a very fertile um you know, sort of area of performance of of, uh, of work that had been neglected for, for a very long time before. So, so there are there are you know I think some positive uh, positive uh, growth of, of people's interest in this. Well, there's uh, so, yeah. a, there's there's a word for this in German. It, it's called Weltschmerz, which everything associated mm -hmm. with German is very literal in terms of its meaning. It literally means world weariness but i find in terms of its implications it's almost too generalized there's a better french word which sort of sums up these feelings for me which is the idea of ennui mm -hmm. funny enough ennui comes out of the french revolution and it comes out of liberal dissatisfaction it's something i would often associate with people like benjamin constant trying to recontextualize and bring back an aspect of the French Revolution throughout the 19th century. And ultimately, they would win, albeit not in the same radical vein as a uh, Hebert or a Robespierre. Nevertheless, I feel that this genuine sort of ideological dissatisfaction, this almost paralytic idea of ideological dissatisfaction, this ennui, is far more real and authentic as in terms of a descriptor for how we feel as traditionists, as reactionaries, whatever word you would assign to it, in terms of trying to compensate or cope with these with these societal, with these historical breaches that we see. And the idea of history in a Christian sense is that of enduring decline. But I'll leave it there in terms of not making the stream even more depressing. <laughs> in the midst of life, we are in death. <laughs> oh, indeed. I, I again, I think I think it's important to be realistic, and uh, and and part of that, of course, is 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 you know, I think that this this uh, ennui, as you as you say, a very really wonderful word for this context. I mean, it's it's real. It's not it's not artificial. It's not something that that should be dismissed. You know, there's a reason. There's a reason we feel it. Right. Malcolm McKee, I think for five Canadian dollars. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see a stream on the on this unfortunate topic. I tweeted recently when Dee retweeted the map image that in an event I'd like to see you cover both. Well, thank you very much, um, Malcolm McKee. Was it this map? Was this your map? Um, D D and I yeah, yeah. Had, yeah, I retweeted. had the same map. So, uh, yeah. Yes, we, we, we featured your map today, so thank you very much. I actually looked at the provenance of this because I'm autistic and that's yeah. the way I love to. <laughs> and apparently, did this, <laughs> uh, apparently this was at a uh, FSSP. It's basically a, a society for uh, Latin mass Catholics, which is right. still in communion with... Um, with the Pope, unlike organizations like the uh, the S um, SSPX. So yes, obviously this is a, a bit of sort of a true Catholicism showing through in terms of never forget. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I spent yeah. about I spent about forty five minutes trying to find 
a high resolution version of it and I was unable to. So. Yes, well, well, even for this stream, due to the, the, the limitations on how I can even understand or do this formatting, um, I, I'm afraid you're, you're not going to really see much of it, but just seeing it and seeing the names is enough to yeah. sort of indicate the scale of the loss. Lady of Shalott for five Australian dollars. Thank you very much. This reminds me of the Bolshevik dismantling of the Russian Orthodox Church, the ruthless, merciless, machine-like way it was enforced by outsiders. Well, this is more tragic in a sense because it wasn't enforced by some alien revolution, which was basically a fluke in terms of all the right circumstances being prepared for Lenin to take over and Lenin having the correct, albeit satanic, ideology to be able to carry it through in the sense that this was carried out by an ostensibly English king who had been granted the title Defender of the Faith by a Pope. In terms of the tragic sort of decline and fall of Henry VIII, and I would say the true Henry VIII is sort of encapsulated in the heroic Gothic imagery of non-such. I look at this as happenstance, and I look at this as tragic. And I don't really understand what, I don't really think Henry VIII really understood the implications of the actions and all of this would have on the future of English history. Um, and like we said, it was a horrific amalgamation of Englanders looking out for themselves. And therefore I do almost see it as a collective shame as yeah. a result of that. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't, it, the blame can't solely be placed on uh on, on Henry, uh, on Henry VIII or Thomas Cromwell, it, it, was, it was collective. It was basically, um, yeah. again, uh, what was it? John Adams' uh, famous uh, tweet about democracy: "Democracy is uh, two wolves and a sheep voting on who to have for lunch." Yeah. In, in, the, in this case, uh, the the the, uh, the monastic orders, the monasteries, were representative of the sheep in this equation. Yeah, Sergius, I sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, and, and you know, again, uh, I do like this this, uh, this conception of Henry VIII as a, as a tragic figure in a way, because of course, you know, at the beginning of his reign, he was the Rena Renaissance prince, and uh, you know, or at least that was that was the frame that he he uh, you know tended to embody, and uh, you know, and then of course this this slow decline and um, this 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 enduring image i always have of him you know the, the, i can't remember one of his contemporaries who who had attended upon his um um his lying in in state you know and uh when when the uh when the casket burst you know and uh, the results of that is that, that a dog was, was seen mm. to be <laughs> licking the floor you know again it's the, the sort of uh kind of perfect image of uh of this uh this complete pine and fall. It's it's like Saruman. It's just this in, disembodied, you know, breeze at the end. Uh, but but again, this Henry VIII was renowned as being incredibly good looking when he was younger. I mean, how old was he when he became when he became king? He was eighteen eight, when yeah, he became eight. king in fifteen oh nine. Um, and he was basically seen as England's deliverance after the penny pinching miserly tyranny of his. Yeah father <laughs> henry the seventh <laughs> yeah, exactly. and um look what look what he became he became a a corpulent repulsive tyrant um yeah. who was uh, and again you can say that um at least there was uh, uh, actually i think this is illustrated through his romantic attachments it wasn't enough for him just to bed any woman he came across with if anything the evidence comes across that he wasn't interested in long-term mistresses <laughs> um and he actually lacked sexual vigor it wasn't that it was all about sex for him when trying to come up with non-such and the parallel of um some sort of the idea the, the, the chivalric idea of the woman as a point of um dedication in that he normally achieved that with jane seymour the tragedy of course was that jane seymour died shortly after the birth of yeah. um Edward the Seventh, uh, sorry, um, Edward the Sixth. So there does seem, in his choice of marriages, to be an attempt to hold on to that and appeal to this chivalric idea of courtly love. And of course, it goes horribly wrong. You could even say that with Catherine of Aragon, um, which, funny enough, despite having been conceived of as an arranged marriage between his brother and 
the daughter of the most Catholic majesties of Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella. In the end, it was a love match and one that was thoroughly disapproved of by Henry VII, who mm. was basically just keeping Catherine of Aragon around at that point as a hostage, not as a future bride to Henry VIII. So, yes, just re-emphasize this aspect of the tragic nature of Henry VIII's character. Yeah. And, he, and he, you know, and again, he, he, this idea that I, I don't think he was motivated by sex. I mean, you also remember, you know, this uh, mention, uh, I, I suppose, during the period when he was, uh, you know, he was trying to dissolve the, the union was that he was he was also, re quote, repulsed by her, her, her Spanish sexual, you know, sort of, practices or something like mm. apparently she'd been too she'd been much more sexually forward or adventurous adventurous than, than, than he liked you know so I, I get this image of him as the, the sort of uh sort of rapacious you know lust lust crazed glutton may not may not be true or certainly not true until much later on i mean if anything he's closer to the the prudish english stereotype <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> Just imagining it, you know, and of course, but of course, very strange because he was a, you know, he was a, a handsome, athletic ginger, you know, <laughs> just like me. <laughs> yes, and he was also the, uh, well, he was his uh, his grandfather's grandson. If we're looking back to Edward the Fourth and uh, all the romance related mishaps going along there. Mm. Anyway, um, Sergius for five dollars. Thank you very much. Uh, would you do a stream with Dean Arnold about the history of Ethiopia? Ethiopia is often overlooked among Christian empires, despite its long history. Yes, I I do want to look at Ethiopia at some point, but it's at the bottom of a very long list, I'm afraid, which is getting increasingly longer. So I'm. It's not a matter of sort of if; it's a matter of when. I'm afraid. Uh, also, I really don't feel that I would be the one qualified to talk about Ethiopia. I mean, I was sort of very much going out of my wheelhouse when I was talking about Armenia. But Ethiopia might just be, well, again, I've talked about Japanese history, so what do I know? <laughs> anyway. Um, you can see, talk about anything. I can talk about, yeah, I could just, 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 <laughs> <laughs> just like the historical version of a Pez dispenser, just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but the but, but much better sweets than Pez. Yeah. Uh, DC for fifty pounds. Wow, gosh, thank you very much, DC. That's very generous. Um, a small token of my appreciation for your work, AM. It'll be fascinating if you could share your approach to research in a future video. I look forward to listening to the stream in full tomorrow. Good evening to you, to Mr. D. Well, thank you very much, DC. Um, as opposed to my approach to research, um, it's very boring and it's very much dependent on what topic I do, because obviously I'm more familiar <coughs> with certain topics than I am others. It's also the matter of is, if it's a scripted video, a scripted lecture or semi-scripted lecture, or if it's a conversation like this, the, the attitude you know, of my research to the topic, you know, changes drastically depending on sort of topic to topic. It also is an emphasis on whether I want to focus on a particular aspect of historiography, whether I want to look into a particular book or whether I want to get some sort of general appraisal of history through looking at academic articles um, or whether I just want to cite a couple of primary sources. It very much varies depending on what I do. And of course, as we've been discussing with the historical Pez dispenser, um, I do cover a wide range of topics across a wide range of periods. I mean, you know, talk about this, say, for example. One, I'm talking about the dissolution of the monasteries today. A month ago, I was talking about the conceptual creation of Pakistan. You know. <laughs> Yeah, you just did Yugoslavia as well. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. That, that, that I'm sure there's some sort of intellectual through line there, but uh, yeah. Lady of Shalott for five Australian dollars. Thank you very much. Uh, libraries today are getting rid of old books, many pre World War Two. I often purchase them for my homeschooling. They are erasing our own history as we speak. Well, that's very noble of you lady of Schlob, but that's also incredibly tragic i mean just thinking about this i was thinking about your namesake um john d and how i believe john d wanted to create his own 
grand library or indeed achieved it if i can't quite remember um, i, d- I was... did i mean he yeah. did yes <laughs> yes but you were no better had... than me <laughs> yeah he, he had uh no he had he he had one of the, the more notable libraries in europe at, at that time according to uh, a, ca- a contemporary accounts um and of course tragically when he was away because he he was abroad ingratiating himself at the court of oh god i can't remember check perhaps uh well, was it rudolf the first of uh austria and yeah, bohemia may i can't have, remember he was around a lot yeah um, anyway it was yeah so so john d went uh yeah was abroad and his library was ransacked uh and most of it most of it um stolen carried away or destroyed so um and and very little of it survived. I mean, there are some volumes that survive. Uh, he was a he was a, a, a by all accounts a heavy annotator of, of his own books, and so there are uh, some books of his from his library that survive with uh, with his notes in the margin. But um, yeah, he he had a he had a quite notable library destroyed. You know, uh, so. Well, I would emphasize too, and. Again, this is just a tragedy as part of a, a long myriad of tragedies which have been going over this evening. But I would advise everyone to get your hands on physical copies of books, especially old books, as unfortunately yeah. this is the case. I mean, even you can't rely on online archives because these online archives, as we've been seeing recently, are just yeah. going to be rich, are going to be um, habitually purged, yeah. and everything is going to have to be re-uploaded at some point. So having physical copies which which again only if they come to your house and start sort of mandatory sort of um <laughs> house to house sort of uh seizures oh. of books we never know um up until that point uh it's more reliable than relying on a uh, vast data banks which can be purged complete completely agree keep, keep physical copies and of digital files keep local copies do not rely on anything to be there or to be to be un- unaltered you know uh, when you buy these old books, I mean, you, you know, again, it's just, uh, I mean, you, you're right. I, I hear like tale of, you know, like Columbo will occasionally say, you know, oh, I went to the bookshop and I got, like, got all got all these books. But of course, you realize that they're all coming up now because they're being discarded. You know, mm. so uh, scoop them up. I mean, I have an enormous, enormous library, which I have no hope of ever getting through. Um, but I, I just habitually uh, uh, buy buy books. Uh, partially for this reason. John Boy for 12 euros. Thank you very much. Thanks. Lovely to hear Mr. D and yourself on this subject. Well, I was very fortunate to get Mr. D to talk about this subject. And thank you very much, John Boy, for listening. And thank you for your super chat. Um, I have seen Wonder of Four ask me the same question over and over again. All I have to say to you, Wanderer 4, is that that is well beyond me in terms of the amount of research I've done for tonight's topic, I'm afraid, <laughs> in terms of the uh, Henry de Bracton's influence from Catholic ecclesiastic- uh, Ecclesiastes on English common law. I'm sorry. <laughs> Very specific topic. Anyway, um, Mr. D, anything you would like to shill before we get out of here this evening? No, nothing to shill if you if you have any interest, of course, you can follow me on Twitter. That's where I commit most of my crimes. Uh, also, I will be on. Uh, I will be on. What's it called? Unpopular <laughs> opinions. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't even know anymore. Tomorrow with the uh, with the uh, what? What is he now? Uh, he's he's a uh, he's a sensible he's a, centrist. A yes. sensible centrist. Oh, he's also a. He's also a Taoist, by the way. I don't know if, <laughs> have you, oh, has he been reading he, the Tao Te Ching? He, he he has been reading the Tao Te Ching, and and now he he even has on his Twitter name he's put a little yin yang uh, emoji. So uh. <laughs> so join me, and we talk about sensible centrism and the the Tao of of Poo with the academic <laughs> age. Uh, and, and and again, thank you very much. I'm I'm honoured always to to speak to you, and uh, it was a wonderful discussion. So, and thank you very much. And likewise, it's been wonderful to have you. And uh, everyone, do check out Unpopular Opinions, co-hosted by Mr. D over on Academic Agents Channel, and do follow him on Twitter. He has wonderful art posts. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, please like and leave a comment. It helps the channel out a lot. 
To see more content like this, subscribe to Abstract Majesty. If you want to support the channel and gain access to members-only content, please consider becoming a channel member. I also have to point out that I may or may not do a lecture presentation on Ludwig II of Bavaria. It may come out next Monday. It may come out the Friday before Christmas, or it might not happen. If I don't see you until then, I just want to wish everyone Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Also, if this channel reaches 17,500 subs, I will finally get around to doing the Sons of Albion series. And of course, there's been a lot of sort of ancient English history, which has been reiterated or regurgitated here on this stream. So it would really give me a chance to get into this in depth if everyone can help that channel, this channel reach that particular milestone. So thank you to Mr. D. Thank you for everyone for watching and good night.